out of practice after six months of uh, not doing this. Um, we have a quorum today, and so I would like to call to order the Legislative Task Force on Child Protection. As many of you know, uh, the task force was established nearly 10 years ago um, following a tragic death of a child in Minnesota. And it has been a goal to make sure that we center ourselves on protecting children. I was named to this task force a month ago. Um, my name is Senator Nicole Mitchell, along with my co-chair Pinto. Um, and typically this task force has met on even years, non-budget years, but especially with myself joining the task force last month and uh, the excellent reporting highlighting some of the inadequacies in our system, we wanted to get a jump start on any policy and uh, taking a more in-depth look at the issues immediately. Uh, we also have new members to the task force, and so today is going to be kind of an overview of some of the different issues that um, we would be potentially looking at. But I will state that my goal is to not overreact or, or to not overcorrect, but to definitely come out of meeting with some of the different agencies with actual legislation on ways that we can better serve the children of Minnesota. With that, I... I I'm hopeful because everyone that I've had a chance to talk to already um, seems to be coming at this at a child-centric focus. Um, I am honored to serve on some of our veterans issues and what I love about that is a lot of people, I see them put away their egos and their partisanship and really just work on the issues. And that's what I would like to challenge all of us here today. Madam to Chair. Oh, okay. Senator Housley. Oh, she might not be able to hear us. Okay, we can hear you. I, I don't know if you're talking to me. We can't hear you. Okay. Thank you for addressing that. So I am sorry, Madam Chair. We didn't hear anything you said. Well, we were, oh, well, I can't tell her now either. <laughs> and I'm sure you're saying good stuff right now, too. I am. We should probably turn on captioning. That's also a good reminder for us to turn on captioning if we haven't done that. Thank the rest of you for your patience. Not sure when this room was used last, but I know they uh, spent a couple hours this morning trying to work out some technical issues. Can, can you hear us yet? No. And Madam Chair, um, I don't know if you're talking, but I know the people on YouTube can hear, but those of us on Zoom can't hear. So if that helps the tech people in any way.
I heard something. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear us? Oh, now I can't. Gone again. Test. Oh, yes, I test. <laughs> we just had to call in the expert. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Again, thank you all for being here today. Um, as I said, I, my hope for this is that we come out with legislation that is able to be very child-centric, um, both making sure that we are mindful of not correcting in a way that good families that maybe need a little help are caused trauma, uh, especially since we know that Minority families, families where there's children with disabilities um, tend to be more likely to have removals. And so we have a lot of partnerships and some of our partner groups who are here today that we want to be working with through that process, but also make sure that the children of Minnesota are safe and that there, when there is a real safety issue that we are doing the appropriate things. So um, thank you everyone for centering yourself today in working for the best of the safety of the children of Minnesota. With that said, before we get started, I would like to offer introductions. Um, I'm going to go first to the one guest I asked to sit at the table today, and that is because any policy that we had on the House would go to Chair Pinto's committee, but in the Senate, it would go to Senator Wicklund's committee, so I thought it was valuable for her to listen in on some of the broad overview today. Um, then, as a heads up, for those of you on Zoom, we will go to Zoom next, um, and then to the people sitting here. So, Senator Wicklin, if you could please introduce yourself and your background, please. Um, thank you. Um, I appreciate being able to be here today. Um, I'm Melissa Wicklin. I represent uh, Senate District 51 in Bloomington, um, Richfield, Minneapolis, and I chair the Health and Human Services Committee. Um, looking forward to learning a lot more and, and trying to find ways to address this um, situation with uh, trying to prevent um, any further um, incidents and uh, trauma to children um, is definitely at the heart of what I hope to do and I hope to learn from um, the discussion what policy might policy recommendations might come to us. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Wickland. We will, I will now ask the two people on Zoom, uh, our two senators, if you could offer an introduction and if you have any um, background in child protection. And of course, we'll have an opportunity for questions later. I see Senator Housley first and then Matthews, at least on my Zoom, if you could please go in that order. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Karen Housley, I represent Senate District 33, Stillwater Forest Lake in the surrounding St. Croix Valley. Um, and I too, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what um, happens, transpires today in the committee and um, have a few questions and do want to work to a solution um, in a bipartisan way. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, Senator Matthews. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Andrew Matthews. I'm the senator from District 27. Uh, my hometown is in Princeton, and I have much of Sherburne County uh, with little bits in uh, Mille Lacs County, uh, Isanti, and Anoka counties. And uh, I'm looking forward to this hearing. Uh, I've been, uh, my experience with child protection has largely come through my time in office. I've tried to help handle some constituent service cases uh, that came to my desk, and I have uh, pushed through a couple good pieces of legislation in the past. Uh, first, that have tried to help with the training aspect of child protection workers around the state, partnered with some 
uh, good folks uh, from some institutes and places that could part be a partner with teaching for that. Um, also passed a law in the last session that I was uh, really happy with uh, in, in, the, in the previous term, uh, went through my committee, the civil law committee that I chaired at the time, that helped strengthen the ability to have uh, placements with family members if there is uh, able family members uh, able to take uh, over that. So um, really important discussions and it seems to be trying to determine which, are, which families need just some minor uh, correction and a little bit of help and which ones are major issues because you can cause problems uh, not pulling a kid that needs to be pulled as well as pulling a kid that shouldn't be pulled. Um, and so that seems to be what the, what the tightrope is that we're trying to walk here. So I'm looking forward to working with all of you on the task force and trying to brainstorm some more ideas. And we've definitely got some more work to do. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Matthews um, and Representative Krisha. Um, again, if we could keep it to uh, just an introduction and any background you have in child protection. Representative. Uh, thank you. I uh, apologize for not being able to be there. Had some last minute changes here. So uh, appreciate the opportunity on Zoom. Uh, so have had some background here, worked on this issue in the past. I represent um, the Little Falls, Morrison County, Aiken, Mille Lacs, Kanabic area. So familiar with the child protection system, also with the counties and things that happen there. I think that it's important as you look at this um, whether or not we need a policy recommendation or what legislation, we don't know. I think what we do have to do is understand um, where the governor and the executive branch's level of understanding was on this um, in the last couple of years and see how this has come together and what information they may or may not have known that they uh, could have reacted to or how we, we could have conveyed that. So. Um, I, I think it's our job as legislators to always look at the executive branch and, uh, again, and see what they knew, what happened. Representative, so. I'm trying to keep us, to, we will have plenty of time for questions and statements. I'm trying to keep us to introductions right now and any specific background in child protection. Um, Madam Chair, I appreciate that, but you also got to set the stage with your introduction. So if it's okay, I don't mind just setting the stage and saying what my level of inquiry would be. I'm, I'm not trying to take shots. I'm just trying to say we should understand this issue. Um, Thank so you. I'll leave it there. I, I guess I understand the tenor of the meeting already. Thank you, Representative. Um, if our other representatives, if we could just come, come up the side, please. Good afternoon, I'm Representative Patricia Mueller from Austin, Minnesota, down in 23B, yep, where they make spam. And um, so come on down, spam use me is free. I was a teacher for almost 20 years, and so for me, this is not something that um, I have been involved with, like DHS or any of those things, but I have seen it personally worked out in my classroom and how it affects my students and my students' families. It's something that I think it is vitally important as we are looking at all the information that we have here, including some of the things that we've seen in the media for us to um, really echo kind of what uh, Representative Krishaw said of looking deeper at what's happening. Thank you. Madam Thank you. Chair. Thank you, Chair. I'm Representative Jess Hansen. I represent District 55A down in Savage and Northwest Burnsville. I've worked on the Youth Foster Ombudsperson Bill with Senator Housley. I have some of the youth fosters here, so I just want to say hello to them. Working with youth in this and keeping a youth voice is really important to me. And then continuing to work with our um, service providers, DHS, and the social workers and so many CPS workers has really been an important piece to me to continue to listen to. And I'm looking forward to all the information. Thanks. Thank you very much. And I am going to skip to the Senate side. I will let my co-chair go last. Um, Senator Kroon. Thank you, Madam Chair, Co-Chair Pinto. Uh, my name is Michael Kroon. I represent uh, District 32 in the State Senate, which is uh, all in Anoka County, Blaine, Ham Lake, Columbus, and Lexington. Uh, my day job is that I'm a lawyer. Uh, my background is primarily in real estate but I do have over seven years of being a volunteer lawyer with the uh, Children's Law Center. And so uh, in that capacity, I have been involved um, on, on the front line, so to speak, in this issue. The Children's Law Center, for those of you that don't know, provides free legal advocacy for youth that are in uh, foster care situations. Um, and so 
uh, I've been involved in that for over seven years um, and have seen um, a lot of this up close and personal in my role uh, there. Also was on the uh, Spring Lake Park School Board for five years before I was in the Senate. And so um, you, you get to see um, a little bit of it from that perspective in that role as well. And I'm looking forward to kind of trying to piece it all together, um, learn the, the, the system in its entirety and, and learn as much as I can and hopefully make some good recommendations to the legislature. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Chair Pinto. John Hoffman, Senate District 34. That's uh, Brooklyn Park, Coon Rapids, Champlin, Dayton, and Rogers. Senate District 34, 22 miles of the Mississippi River, uh, both Hennepin County and Anoka County. So I have that other part of Anoka County that Senator Cruin doesn't have. The, um, the background that I have uh, early on in my life, I spent uh, seven years in a juvenile detention facility as its supervisor and then we both had the juvenile detention work and we had the shelter work in a county and then from there I went to the state level and helped bring in the Iowa Early Intervention Services Program which became Iowa Early Access and that was the difference between Part H and Part C of the federal law and then from there moved back home to Minnesota uh, I was on the Anoka Hennepin School Board as its vice chair for eight years and of course that is the largest school district in the state of Minnesota. I've been a past member of this committee and, and uh, early on I remember Representative Rena Moran and I were the only two elected officials that sat and took testimony for three hours one day and it was um, pretty compelling and pretty heart-wrenching and I'm glad you brought up the fact of people with disabilities because that clearly is uh, an issue there as long as we're talking about that to the educational integration that needs to occur as well but uh, it's good to be back in this realm and I look forward to getting some things done this year thank you thank you Senator Hoffman and co-chair Pinto thank you madam chair and thanks uh, to members of the task force and members of the public for being with us um, I, so Dave Pinto representing the southwest part of St. Paul. I work outside the legislature as a prosecutor um, and so have some interaction with the system in that role. Um, I wanted to slightly correct a comment you'd made earlier, Madam Chair, about the, the genesis of the task force um, and just want to make sure we're kind of uh, to set the stage here. Um, so there was a governor's task force that came out of um, some reporting nearly 10 years ago now and the legislative task force in child protection, which I served on for a little bit of time along with Senator Hoffman and um, then represent Moran and, and others, um, was established to kind of oversee recommendation that came out of that governor task force. That task force actually sunsetted and there was no task force for a couple years. And then it was a little while back now that then Senator Johnson, now the Republican lead, um, and I thought that it would make sense for there to be some sort of uh, a, a forum for legislators to focus on child protection issues beyond just the committees. Um, Cause we know these issues tend to be a small piece of much bigger committees. Um, ultimately it is those committees where legislation moves, um, but to have a chance for legislators to look a little bit separately seemed like a really useful thing. Um, so that is this task force. So it has the same name as the prior one, but potentially a little bit of a different um, role or just it's this opportunity. And of course, I'm so glad, and I think the other folks up here are as well, um, that we have this forum then that was sort of it's, it's set up um, that, that it's so important that we use. So I'm really grateful for the chance for the partnership um, with you, um, Madam Co-Chair, and, and members of the task force um, as we try to figure out kind of how to use this best. This task force um, meets quarterly um, and you know it's a part-time legislature and so figuring out the best way to use this time together and to use the work um, uh, to kind of make that make that work um, I'm not saying that by the way to say that then the next time it meets in three months I'm sure we'll address that before the the end of the day today but simply so that we're just sort of aware of at least the context in terms of how this task force was set up and then looking forward to the discussion today and then I'm sure before the end of the day we'll have more discussion about where things go from here um, so thank you again madam chair and thanks members very much much. And thank you, Co-Chair Pinto. Um, to piggyback off of that before I give my formal introduction, um, one of the things that I have been looking at is because the legislature is technically part-time and a lot of us are on different committees and things of that nature, um, and we want to get give this issue as, as much focus with um, in, in addition to our amazing backgrounds or some of the amazing backgrounds that people here have. Um, the people at the table who are doing the daily work, we have been talking about possibly putting to, 
together an advisory opinion where we can bring the different organizations to the table. Um, and that's something I know the governor has committed money for this within the next year um, or within the next budget cycle. And that's something that I think we're going to be having some discussions on if that is a way that we can make sure that we're being really mindful with any legislation that we go forward with. Um, with that said, I am Co-Chair Mitchell from the Senate. I represent District 47, which is South Maplewood and all of Woodbury. My background is um, as a volunteer, I've worked with children in both a domestic violence shelter and a homeless shelter and kind of other capacities. I was a court appointed special advocate uh, for several years, and currently I have been a foster parent both uh, full-time and through respite care since 2018 um, to include children with disabilities, which do often end up in foster care or using respite care, which I think is a, is a great opportunity to, for families to get some of the support they need, um, but also stay together um, you, it, when we can support families in some of those creative ways. So. With all of that said, and thank you all for your introductions today and your interest in the topic, um, I would like to start with the first item on the agenda, which is um, a presentation on the Office of Legislative Auditor. Um, thank you for coming up. We have Judy Randall and Dave Kirshner today to bring us that presentation. I am going to ask that everyone, because this is a longer presentation, to save questions to the end, because whatever the question is could possibly be answered later on. So if we can wait till questions for the end, and I will turn it over to you. Uh, if you could introduce, and thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. For the record, my name is Judy Randall, Legislative Auditor. And as you said, with me at the table is David Kirchner, who is the manager of our 2022 evaluation, Child Protection Removals and Reunifications. Um, I do want to thank um, both co-chairs for convening this task force and having you all come here today. Um, we, too, have been reading the Star Tribune series with um, kind of our hearts full and reading those stories about um, specific situations that children and young adults and families have been in. Um, and they have been awful to read about. Our evaluation looks at the, the system, although we were talking about it, that it's really 80 different systems, not one statewide system. So our report looks at the um, child protection removals and reunifications from maybe the 10,000 foot level and lays out the complexity and the varied um, set of systems we have across the state. Um, there are numerous players, certainly you know DHS and county social service agencies. There are courts, judges, law enforcement has an important role. Um, and so really understanding the intricacies, the overlapping roles um, and how this all works and maybe where it doesn't work perfectly um, that's what we're hoping to um, help you understand here today. So with that, Madam Chair, I'd like to turn to Mr. Kirchner, who will kind of get into the details of our report. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Mr. Kirchner. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and uh, before I get started, can I just confirm that our legislators on Zoom are able to see the presentation? I think that's probably a good thing to do, given where we're at. Did they, did they see the slideshow? Can we double check that? No, we don't see it. Sorry to interrupt you. We don't see it, Madam Chair. Working on it. I'm glad I asked. <laughs> now we see it. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, once again, for the record, my name is David Kirshner. I am an evaluation coordinator with the Legislative Auditor's Office, and I was the manager for our 2022 uh, uh, report on child protection removals and reunifications. And just before I get started, I should note that actually the work for this report was done in 2020, and then there was a little bit of a delay getting the report out. So, and the work was a retrospective look at cases that had already uh, run their course by that point. So a number of the things that I'm presenting are, are data that come from like 2017, 2018, 2019. So just be aware that there's been a little bit of a lag here in terms of the information I'm presenting. Um, the key findings <coughs> of our report is that 
uh, I, I'll start with them. The Minnesota's child protection system is very decentralized. Most child removals begin with uh, emergency law enforcement holds, but um, the way in which that occurs from place to place around the state does uh, vary significantly, and I'll get into that. There is a requirement in law that reasonable efforts uh, be undertaken in order to prevent removals from occurring, but exactly what those reasonable efforts were seemed uh, to differ from uh, one case to another. Um, the judicial branch has performance measures, um, and we generally think that's a, a good thing that they try and, and assess their performance, but we think that they're limited and perhaps could be expanded a little bit. And lastly, that plans provided to Parents, um, although very detailed and appropriately very detailed, often can be somewhat complex and difficult for parents to understand when they're trying to figure out what their responsibilities are in order to pursue reunification. So with that very quick overview of our key findings, uh, let me get into a little bit of, of background just to start off. And uh, the background is important because it is a very complex system, as um, Auditor Randall noted. Um, as has already been alluded to, um, there are kind of two broad goals in Minnesota's child protection statutes. Um, one, uh, and the paramount goal, is to protect children's safety. And that appears in a number of places in uh, the law. Um, and a second extremely important goal that also appears in a number of places in the law, the, the spots that I have here on the slide are just examples of one place, um, is the attempt to try and keep families together as much as possible while protecting, um, the, uh, protecting children's safety. And those two goals uh, in the types of cases that we're talking about can be difficult to balance, trying to balance both that desire to um, keep children safe and that desire to protect the family unit as much as possible. The cases that uh, child protection officials deal with are often cases that challenge keeping both of those things at the forefront all of the time. Child protection has many components, um, and there are many ways in which we might think about child protection, both in terms of the circumstances that occur and in terms of the actions that are taken by various government entities to deal with those circumstances. Um, on the left side of the slide here, child protection encompasses a wide variety of different circumstances, certainly instances where children are at risk because of the action or inaction of their parents. Uh, but child protection also encompasses situations where children are at risk outside the home, perhaps when they're in educational or religious settings and they are placed in danger. Um, when children pose a danger to themselves or to others, then that is also something that falls under the umbrella of child protection. Children who run away, children who are habitually truant, all of these things fall within the, the big kind of universe of child protection. And then there are, to deal with all of those different circumstances, a variety of different responsibilities and actions, not all of which rest with the same individuals within the system. There is the screening of reports that come in. People make reports that children are being maltreated and looking to see, uh, find out more about whether or not those should be pursued. There is the assessment and investigation processes, which I think you're going to hear a presentation on a little bit later on this afternoon. Um, there are the efforts to do education and outreach so that people know where they, they can report something if they suspect a child is being maltreated or that families know what services might be available to them. Um, there are those family services and the prevention services that might happen in order to try and prevent things from getting to a point where we have to talk about whether or not a child should be removed. There is the actual process of removing children from a home from when those, protect, when those uh, services have not been sufficient or there was not an opportunity to provide them. And then the decision about what happens once the child is removed from the home. Have circumstances changed to where it's safe to return the child to the home, or should that child remain outside the home? And then the entire world of foster care, which is a huge topic in and of itself. And we did not look at all of the things on this slide. I want to kind of say that what we narrowed in our focus in on this report at the request of the Legislative Audit Commission were those specific circumstances where children were at risk due to their parents' action or inaction, and those cases where we specifically got to the point of talking about removing children from the home. So there's a lot of other child protection stuff we didn't talk about, but these were the things that we specifically focused our efforts on. Now, 
whether or not to remove a child from a home is an extraordinarily important responsibility. And Minnesota law gives that, this responsibility very narrowly to two specific entities. Child protection agencies, and by that I mean the county social service agencies that usually have a child protection division or a child protection office within that agency. County social service agencies do not have the authority to remove a child from the home. That is not given to them by Minnesota law. The only, in, the only people that are able to remove a child from the home without the consent of the parents are law enforcement officers who may place a child on a 72-hour emergency hold and the courts. Um, child protection agencies are not given that responsibility. Of course, there is always uh, the option that parents may decide that they wish to uh, have a child uh, be placed outside the home on their own, and they can do that either formally or informally. Uh, but uh, when parental consent is there, then it's a whole different ball of wax. But if there is not parental consent, just law enforcement or the courts, not child protection agencies. And if it, we're talking about a long-term placement beyond that 72-hour period, that has to be a court order. Um, once there is a law enforcement emergency hold, there are three paths that uh, can be taken. And this is a, um, I don't know if you guys have our full report with you at the table, but this is a, a, um, this is a simplification of a chart that appears on page eight of that report. Um, there are three paths that can take place after an emergency hold. First of all, local authorities might decide to return the child to the parents because either uh, the decision is made that the situation was not as dangerous as first thought or that the danger, uh, the threat level has changed. Uh, and one example might be that a child uh, may have been considered to be, there may have been an adult in the home that was considered to be a threat to the child. And that adult has since been removed from the home. And then the decision is made, well, then it's safe to return the child from the home uh, after the adult was removed from the home, for example, by law enforcement activity or some other reason in which the adult went outside the home. Um, but that can take place before we ever get to a court hearing. That decision that the child, that circumstances have gotten to the point where the child can be removed to the home, that decision can be made um, by uh, child protection service authorities or, uh, or county attorneys, or uh, often it's a combination of people working together. Once you get to that 72 hour period and the child has not been returned to the, to the home, there must be a court hearing, the emergency protective care hearing. And at that point, the court makes a formal decision whether or not uh, the child should remain outside the home or whether or not the child should be returned to the home. Um, a third path that can be taken um, is that during that 72 hour period, during that emergency hold thing, the parents may agree for the child to be out of the home for a longer period of time. And so that's called a, a voluntary out of home placement. And in that circumstance, the parents uh, still have the ability to say, actually we wanna end that and bring the child back because the child is still technically in the, I don't wanna get too much into law here, but the, the parents still have custody of the child um, and can request that the child come back uh, because they have voluntarily placed the child outside of the home. Uh, if the county uh, uh, child protection service agency then disagreed, then we would go back toward the court hearing and we'd go back to a court process. Um, once a court has ordered that a child is be placed outside of the home, the child enters longer term foster care. And then at that point, only the court can determine that that, how that placement ends, whether or not the placement ends with a return to the child back to the home, whether or not the child is placed long term with relatives, whether or not the child is adopted uh, in, through, a, through an adoption process. Uh, that is a court decision. So once you have that court decision to place the child outside the home, there must be a court decision for how that placement ends. So with that kind of legalish sort of background, I wanna talk a little bit about the system that we have to put all this in place, because there are a lot of different actors involved, as, uh, as uh, Auditor Randall said. Minnesota is one of nine states that provides child protection services at the county level. Uh, most states provide, have a, a state agency that is uh, a child protection agency. Minnesota, however, does it at the county level. It's not alone, but it is, it is one of only nine states that does that. Um, and that means that local officials and individual district courts have substantial discretion to interpret the law as it relates to child protection and to figure out what the best uh, uh, decision will be in individual circumstances. Local people are making local decisions. 
Um, and I will note that some services are not, we shouldn't necessarily think about it just as at the county level. Some services are provided below that level at a city level. As I noted, law enforcement officers play a very important role. They're the only ones that have the ability to take a child outside their home. And those law enforcement decisions might be somewhat different if it is a city uh, police force or if it is a county sheriff's office or, uh, or another law enforcement agency. So we have multiple different levels of government going on here. And in addition to the child protection agencies and law enforcement, we have a number of other people that may be involved in the conversations around the decision of what to do when you reach the point of removal. Um, certainly the attorneys for the parents and children uh, may play an important role in those conversations. Um, the county attorneys may play a, a very important role since they're the ones that frequently have to argue before the court that the court ought to make that decision uh, to, uh, to uh, place the child outside the home for a longer period of time. Um, we have guardians ad litem who are court appointed representatives for the children uh, who are uh, to kind of take the role of advocating for the children in the court proceedings. Um, as I mentioned, law enforcement agencies, the Minnesota Department of Human Services, of course, plays kind of a, a broader role in terms of funding a lot of the things that are going on here. And then whenever you have children that are uh, enrolled in American Indian tribes, then you also have the role of tribal representatives. And if the case goes, uh, is shifted from uh, Minnesota courts to tribal courts, then you have the roles of tribal attorneys and tribal uh, judges as well. So a large number of people involved in trying to figure out how to move forward with these uh, cases. As might not be surprising, when you have so many different entities involved, we have a fairly fragmented system of oversight. DHS and the Federal Children's Bureau are uh, very involved in oversight, but they are primarily looking at things kind of from a system-wide level. Um, rather than at individual cases, although DHS does have a unit that provides technical assistance in individual cases, not so much of kind of an oversight role in terms of what they're doing at the individual case level. It's more system level. Courts, of course, review individual cases, and they have oversight of what happens in an individual case. But as I noted, some cases don't actually ever get to court. There is a decision made and the child is returned to um, the home before we ever get to that point of a court hearing. And then we have the role of law enforcement. And as is true with other law enforcement responsibilities, we do not have a central entity that oversees all the law enforcement agencies in Minnesota to check whether or not they're carrying out their responsibilities appropriately. And that is true for child protection as well. Uh, before I get to the end of this kind of background section, some, some, just some numbers, some recent trends. Um, in 2019, which was the last year of data that we looked at, just over 6,000 children were removed from their homes in Minnesota. That was actually a, a decline. Um, that was the lowest number over the six year period leading up to 2019. It had kind of gone up, it peaked in 2017, went down again. Uh, the most common reasons, and these are the primary reasons listed in DHS's data, were uh, drug abuse by the parent or caretaker or neglect. But as you will see, I have on the slide those percentages, it's 26 and 23%, that's only half of the cases. So there are a wide variety of other circumstances that come up that lead to the decision to take a child out, uh, out of the home as the primary reason, uh, ranging from a medical or emergency that occurs to the caretaker, the ranging to sometimes horrific physical or sexual abuse, a wide variety of different circumstances uh, that, that, that child protection agencies have to deal with. American Indian children and African American children are more likely than other children to be removed from the home. That's true nationwide and it's true in Minnesota. It's been true for decades and it's been something that has been known and talked about and strategized about in this policy space for years. And yet it is still uh, an intractable uh, uh, problem and is, is still the case. And it is, it is worth not noting and acknowledging that. And I will, uh, and lastly I'll say that law enforcement holds in Minnesota those law enforcement holds are the most frequent form of removal. There are definitely many cases in which what happens is a child protection agency goes to a court and asks the court to, do the, uh, to authorize the removal, and that certainly happens in a fair number of cases, but the majority of cases begin, in, excuse me, the majority of removals begin with a law enforcement emergency hold. I wanna, uh, now talk more specifically about law enforcement emergency holds because we have a lot of variation in how that works around the state. 
Some localities use law enforcement holds far more than others. I have a chart here on the slide. This is um, a very simplified version of a rather detailed map that appears on page 30 of our full report. Um, but what I want to emphasize on this slide is that we have quite a, a, a difference in terms of counties, in terms of how frequently they use law enforcement holds. Uh, in some um, in some county jurisdictions, and I should note that some of these are multi-county agencies, not, it's not always one county, one agency. But uh, in some jurisdictions, more than 80% of uh, the removals begin with a law enforcement hold. That's obviously the first direction they go in. A law enforcement hold is the first way that they, uh, they move forward when they believe that they need to have a removal of a child from the home. Uh, and that's true for, for 12 of the, count, of, the, uh, of the agency areas. But for 11 of the agency areas, about as many, less than 40% of the removals begin with a law enforcement hold. That is, in those cases, they are primarily going to a court and seeking a court order to remove the child and not relying on law enforcement. Why that is seems to be a matter of local practice and custom, um, and it just simply varies from one place uh, to another throughout the state. Um, also, the outcomes that follow holds vary significantly throughout the state. Again, we have a somewhat more detailed chart in uh, the report on page 36, but this simplified chart I have up on the slide just indicates the wide differences we have in terms of what happens after a hold, whether or not um, uh, there is no further out-of-home placement after that emergency hold. So you'll see the top of the slide, Beltrami County, in practically every instance where a child is removed from the home with a law enforcement hold, there is a subsequent court decision that the child remain outside of the home for a longer period of time. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, Washington County, at the bottom of this slide, more than a third of the instances where a child is removed from the home by a law enforcement hold, that child is returned to the parents um, before the, uh, or at the, either before or at the end of that 72-hour hold period. So wide, wide differences in terms of what happens after that law enforcement hold occurs. One of the things that we noted uh, also about law enforcement holds are some limit, kind of not a whole lot out there in terms of the data that is available about what specifically happens with regard to which specific law enforcement agency. That is, we can give you that information about Washington County. We can tell you how many holds there were in Washington County but we can't tell you how many were done by the city of Stillwater Police and how many were done by Washington County Sheriff's Office and how many done were any other jurisdiction because that information is not collected by anyone, or at least it wasn't at the time that we were doing our report. And we thought given those differences that we observed, it would have been really interesting to look to see whether or not more or fewer holds were done by uh, individual law enforcement agencies within these county jurisdictions, but simply nobody was collecting that data. Uh, and that was something that, we, that concerned us. We thought that data ought to have been available to us. Also, we noted that there are no ongoing training requirements for law enforcement with regard to child protection, even though that is one of the most intrusive ways in which law enforcement can interact with a family. It is, of course, required that law enforcement officers, when they're at the academy, receive training on child protection issues. But then after that point in time, there's no requirement. That's not to say that there isn't training. Many agencies do provide uh, some training on their own, but there's no requirement that that training might happen. And there certainly may be instances, and I'm sure there are, where you have law enforcement officers who have been on the job 15 or 20 years and are placed in positions where they have to make a decision about whether or not a child should be removed from the home, and they're relying on that academy training from 15 or 20 years earlier. So we had two recommendations with regard to uh, the law enforcement uh, hold stuff. First of all, we do think that uh, DHS ought to be tracking which individual law enforcement agency places emergency holds. That's something that we th felt they had the capacity to do, and we thought that was important information to be collecting. We also suggested that DHS convene a working group to make recommendations to the legislature about law enforcement training. There are an awful lot of things that we might want to train law enforcement officers about, so it, I, we, we didn't feel comfortable making a recommendation about this in not paying attention to all the other th things that law enforcement officers have to be trained on. But we do think it's a conversation that should be had. And we also uh, think that there may be some nuance involved here, that the expectations for training might be rather different if we're talking about an urban uh, police force with uh, hundreds of officers versus a county sheriff's office with you know, a dozen officers or less, there may be some differences in terms of the expectations that we have. That should be 
we felt that should be sorted out with a working group with recommendations brought to the legislature. I now want to talk about efforts to prevent removals. Um, as I noted when I got, talked about the key findings at the beginning of the presentation, under state and federal law, agencies must make what are called reasonable efforts to avoid removals of children from the home when they're not necessary. However, um, statutes, neither federal or state statutes, clearly define what exactly reasonable efforts are. It, reasonable is kind of left up to the discretion of local officials and district courts as to what reasonable is and what reasonable is not. Um, I will note that a higher and much more specific standard applies to American Indian children. Under the Indian Child Welfare Act, the Federal Indian Child Welfare Act, or Minnesota's uh, uh, Minnesota uh, Indian, I'm, I'm going to get it wrong, Minnesota MIFPA, Indi Minnesota Indian Family, Indian Family Protection Act, I think I've got it. Preservation, Some, Preservation. Preservation Act, thank you. Um, uh, there are much more specific requirements in terms of what uh, is required in terms of active efforts. And it's much clearer whether or not the Child Protection Agency has done or not done those things because the outline for what active efforts are is rather clear. Reasonable efforts, it's a much more vague standard. And when we looked at a sample of 150 different cases where we read just about everything that was in the record related to um, those removals and what happened afterwards, um, we found that the prevention services that we could see being provided to families before a child's removal varied widely. In some cases, they varied widely based upon the different circumstances that were going on in that particular case, but sometimes they just varied simply, it seemed like, because they were in different places in the state. Um, we found that courts accepted many different actions and levels of activity as reasonable, um, and that some court orders uh, even found that reasonable efforts had occurred, but didn't really explain what those reasonable efforts had been. They just simply said, we find that reasonable efforts happened, which made it difficult for us to even interpret what the court had, to, had used as its standard for what reasonable was. Now, we would have made um, some uh, very direct recommendations about prevention services um, uh, in our report, but at the same time we were working on our report, things were changing. And they were changing because of a law that uh, was put into place at the federal level in 2018, the Family First Prevention Services Act, which mandated that states meet new requirements regarding prevention services. And so at the time that we were working on our report, DHS and the judicial branch were putting into place uh, new initiatives to respond to the federal law and to the availability of new federal funding for types of services that had not received federal funding before. Um, and so because we didn't feel like we had been able to see what was actually happening, because we were retrospectively looking at what had happened previously, we, did not, uh, we, we didn't feel we were able to evaluate kind of the new prevention services that were being put into place. So we simply made a broad recommendation that prevention services are really important and we really encourage both DHS and, um, and the judicial branch to keep working in that direction. But I, I think that is a, a wonderful direction for this uh, task force to, to ask further questions about because by this point all that stuff should have been implemented and they should be able to tell you more about those prevention services they're doing. Lastly, I want to talk about placements and about reunifications. Within, um, we looked at the data and we found that within two years of most removals, children were either reunified with a parent or placed long-term with relatives. Now that's most, that's not all, but the majority of removals, children ended up with relatives, either the, the family they came from or with other relatives. Um, we also found that out-of-home placements with relatives increased uh, substantially between 2014 and 2019. Uh, I have a chart on the slide that, that, that shows that increase. We jumped from 44% up to uh, 50, nearly 60%, where children spent over half of their time outside of the home in, in, in placements with relatives. Um, and I will note that that can also include, this is kind of a funny thing in the terminology, that can also include placements back with the child's uh, family, that there are what are called trial home placements. And so a child can technically be in foster care with their own family because they are still within the custody of uh, the Child Protection Agency, but it's in a trial home placement. 
Um, I will note that that increase in children being placed uh, with families was larger for African American and Hispanic children. And one of the things that we saw was that there had been a significant gap in the percentage of children placed with relatives in 2014. And by 2019, that gap had narrowed significantly. So that's not to say that all disparities went away, but at least in this one little area, that disparity had reduced significantly over that five-year period. As I mentioned uh, at, in the key findings, we did take a look at the performance measures that um, the judicial branch has with regard to child protection cases. And um, we applaud the judicial branch for having performance measures. We're the legislative auditor. We like to see agencies evaluate themselves and, and, um, and check to see that they're doing a good job. But we did have some concerns that these performance measures were almost entirely focused on time, on how quickly cases moved through the system. And there are other responsibilities that courts have that go beyond timely processing of cases. And timely processing is very important. We don't want children to be in foster care any longer than they, they have to be. Um, but there are other important responsibilities as well. And these would include, for example, making sure that courts get uh, the reports they're supposed to get from child protection agencies. It includes making sure that attorneys are appointed for children and for parents. It includes um, making sure that uh, tribes are notified when a, a, a child is enrolled as a member or is eligible for enrollment with an American Indian tribe. Those are also court responsibilities, and we didn't so, see those being measured. And so those were th we encouraged the judicial branch to consider additional performance measures beyond those specifically focused on time uh, alone. Uh, and my last slide here, I want to talk about uh, parent information. Um, our review of cases suggested that parents uh, who have a child removed from their home get a lot of paper. Um, there are out-of-home placement plans that are required, and these placement plans are very detailed. They include information about education and about health care and about visitation and lots of things in there. And so the, you have a 20, 30-page report, and if there are, is more than one child removed from the home, you might get two or three of these 20, 30-page reports, and then there might be court filings as well. There's a lot of stuff. And one of the things that we didn't see was a simple one-page here are the conditions you have to meet in order to pursue reunification. And we thought that was something that would be valuable so that parents, in addition to this inundation of paper, and it's not to say that those other things aren't important, they are, but would to get a simple, clear, here are the conditions. Here are the things the court has said that you have to meet if you want to pursue reunification um, and have your child back in your home. Uh, and if you're able to pursue those things successfully, then the, the, that's the those are the steps that you need to take in order to get a favorable court decision. So we recommended that the, child, that the legislature require child protection agencies to provide parents with a short and easy to understand summary document that, that provides those requirements. With that, Madam Chair, I'm done with my presentation and I would be happy to take any questions from the committee. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I have some questions myself, but does anyone on the panel have any immediate questions? Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the overview, and then um, well done. I mean, it was, you looked at it, and you gave some historical perspective to that, and I'm, I'm wondering if when you were doing your dive in on the data, did it show, because we know nationally, um, when you start to talk about intersectionality of this category and that category, and you add disability to that category, you're three times as likely, right? You're shaking your head, so yes, that was in there. And I just wanted to know, um, did you have a, a desirable outcome or, or an opinion on you know, why we still don't think in the word of intersectionality when it comes to presenting data at all? Mr. Kirshner. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the question, Senator Hoffman. Um, this is, um, these are topics that have been studied uh, by people for quite a long time. Um, and the answers are complex, and there's not a single uh, magic bullet and says, ah, we figured, if we had figured it out, we would have fixed it a long time ago. <laughs> At least we, we hope we would have, right? Um, it, there, there, there is a lot of complexity involved in these cases. And so um, uh, I think it has been challenging to come up with answers for why we have um, more children involved uh, that have disabilities or, or, or families that have disabilities because there's both sets of issues going on. Um, 
that are involved with the child protection system. It's challenging to figure out why we have more children with African American families involved in the child protection system. It's challenging why we have so many more families of American Indian background involved with the child protection system. There are probably multiple, um, uh, there are probably multiple uh, what sort of different streams of explanation coming in. And I, 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 so I think it, it, is, it is a complicated question and, and we'll probably have complicated answers. I, I, I would like to be able to say, uh, and we would have loved to give a recommendation. Ah, here's the magic thing. Do this and it will all go away. Um, we, didn't, we didn't feel like we had such a recommendation to make. Um, so we point to those things as being ongoing difficult issues to grapple with. Uh, but we did not, it, nothing met our standard for what we could say as a recommendation where we felt confident there would be a big improvement. Thank you, Madam Chair, as a follow-up. The, uh, I met with the Noka County folks in the, the county. There's a, a direct link between poverty and some other these other actions, and, and, and that's in there as well. And I, I would hope that we can pull that, extract some of those uh, things from the report going forward. We just have to be very conscious of that. It's not just isolated, um, as siloed approaches here, but there's multiple factors in play. And, and I think we're also waiting on some family first initiatives from the federal government this, this year as well, too. So we line it up. So once again, thank you for your time and your work on this. I appreciate that. Thank you. And I, I would just like to um, point out to everyone that we do also have a DHS is going to be presenting a little bit later on some of the, the pathways and also the counties speaking about the same level. So um, hopefully we can get a little bit more insight into some of those issues. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for that presentation. Um, I'm going back to what's uh, labeled page seven of your slideshow here about uh, recent trends at, um, in mm -hmm. the just over 6,000 children that were removed from homes in 2019. And in the second bullet point, um, it talks about the common reasons, and it has uh, caretaker drug abuse at 26%, alleged neglect at 23%. But my question is, can't there be multiple reasons why a, a child is removed from the home? And, Anecdotally, in my experience and the people I've talked to, which includes like Senator Hoffman, the Anoka County Attorney's Office, um, their perception and my perception is that chemical dependency is, is much higher than 26%. And I, I was just wondering if you could elaborate on how you came to those percentages. Mr. Krishner. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you very much for the question. It, I, I'm sorry if I gave the impression that these were the only reasons, um, because that is not the case. So uh, the way in which DHS's data, which is what this is drawn from, is, is put together is that there is a primary reason and then there are secondary reasons. And it is absolutely the case that there were a large number of, uh, beyond 50%, where, uh, where drug abuse and neglect were one of the reasons, either primary or secondary. So that is absolutely correct. Um, and I'm sorry if I gave the impression that there was not drug abuse in the other 50%. Um, but that, uh, but it, 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 it is often, as you said, um, these are families that are struggling. And they're often struggling with multiple things. And the fact that they're struggling, for example, with poverty makes it harder to deal with the drug abuse. Or the fact that they're struggling with drug abuse makes it harder to deal with the poverty. And both of those makes it harder to deal with uh, protecting the safety of the children. All of those things uh, interconnect. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, and I, I wasn't implying that you're leaving. I was making a point through a question yeah. primarily. <laughs> but um, <laughs> the, one other question I had um, when you were discussing the um, reasonable efforts for reunification, that kind of standard, and, and how uh, potentially you could have more concrete things. I'm wondering if um, in your audit, when you were looking at um, kind of how that varied uh, among courts, um, were those, did those include both contested and uncontested matters in terms of reunification? And, and the reason I ask is because in my experience where a lot of times the parents aren't necessarily contesting and they realize they're not in a place yet to have their child reunified with them. And in those cases, there may not be as much of a, an outline or bullet point list of factors for the court to find reasonable efforts to reunify as there would be if the parent is contesting that and saying, no, I want my kids back. So I'm just wondering if your audit took that into consideration. Mr. Krishner. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. And that is an excellent and nuanced point about uh, what we were trying to do. We were trying to figure out what reasonable efforts had been taken. Court orders are not the world's best example of that, but the thing is, is the court is, the court is required to find that reasonable efforts occurred. And so we were trying to figure out, well, what did they use as a, their standard for reasonable? You're, you're absolutely correct that if, a, if, if there is not, if it's not a contested case, a court may, uh, a judge may decide in writing the order, I'm not going to go into a great deal of d detail about reasonable efforts because everyone's in agreement that the child needs to remain outside the home because it is a, it is not a, a contested thing. But then that still leaves you know, us with the difficulty of trying to figure out, well, what was, re like, what was the court standard? You know, whether or not they, 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 the reasonable efforts were there or not, is, it, it's hard for us to tell what standard the court used to determine what's reasonable if, if they don't write that in there. Now, do we need a law that says that the courts must always write down what exactly, I don't know what the answer to that is, but I do know that uh, our, our finding is simply that reasonable efforts, the whole world of prevention, and then what constitutes the standard, how much prevention is appropriate, um, how, much, how many efforts should be provided to a family, um, is very vague and is really left up to the individual discretion and, and judgment of, of individual uh, child protection agencies and district court judges. Uh, it's, not, it's not something that it's easily to, to define and wrap your, wrap your fingers around. Senator Kern. Thank you, Madam Chair. And then one final comment on the um, amount of paperwork that a family gets. Um, you know, I do, it would be ideal if you could get it down to a one pager. Um, but I just wanted to comment, um, in my experience, when it's done right, the judges basically do that in court orally. It may not be reflected in the paperwork, but what I've seen is a judge really kind of giving it in its simplest terms, this is what you need to do as a parent. So I just wanted to throw that in there for consideration. Thank you. I, did you have, I didn't think yeah. that was a question, but do you have a response? I, 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 thank you very much, Madam Chair. I will note that I, I, I it was, that was uh, what was reported to us by a number of folks that that does happen. Um, our feeling was that asking people to remember what happened and what exactly they were told on a day that might have been exceptionally stressful and stress, exceptionally emotional, there, I, we couldn't see a reason why you wouldn't also put it in on paper where they would have it afterwards. I, I agree with that. I was just pointing that out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Hassan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Commissioner, for the presentation. As somebody who has worked in the county as a social worker in child protection many years ago, I will say that we have come a long way, uh, but we still have many barriers. Um, I, reading the report, um, I have not seen the mention of like systemic racism. Some of the biggest problems that we have um, is a system that was designed to keep some people out and some people in. Um, we can, as legislators, legislate bias. Bias is a human thing. Um, and you can give as many you know, trainings as you want in implicit bias, but it still exists. I used to work as a social worker, um, and I worked with many people who didn't look like me, many people who didn't understand into the homes that they're going into and the cultures that are present and the languages and the customs and the norms. They walk in. They have perception of what a good parent is, and that is the standard mainstream uh, you know, perception of a good parent. And I'm going to say a white parent. That's what a definition of a good parent is. That's my experience when I'm, what I'm talking about right now. And you just have you know, your check marks. Oh, they're not doing this. They're not going to ask questions of like, why is this not present in your home, or why is this the you know, the behavior, or why is this parent acting this way? Well, if it's not there in their checklist, then, oh, they must be a bad parent. They must be a bad parent. I left my job because of how much bias and systemic barriers that were present in our system. Um, but in this report, I, I, I did not see, you know, any of that spoken to. There's cultural issues, language issues, so many barriers. And then you have a parent who is experiencing probably the worst thing that could happen or the second worst thing that could happen in their life because their child is removed and put in with, 
you know, strangers, and we expect them to like pull themselves up together and do everything on that list in the time period that is supposed to happen, which is like, unless you have a magic wand, not possible. And if you don't do it before you know it, literally some of the parents, before they can even take a deep breath and say, what is actually happening to me? Their child is gone. So the system, I'm, I'm glad that we're shedding a light on the system. The system is severely broken. It's a system that doesn't really work on the benefit of the child or the parent because what's best for the child is that they stay with their family. And whatever you know, issues that um, their parent is experiencing, if it's mental illness, if it's poverty, poverty and neglect are two totally different things. If a family can't feed their children that, because they don't have any resources, that does not mean that it's neglect. It means that the family doesn't have resources to feed their children. So um, I'm really happy that we're having this conversation. I'm really happy that this report came out. But I just want to say, put it on, on out there that there is a lot of bias, systemic racism, cultural barriers, uh, language barriers, custom barriers, and tradition barriers that are the reason why so many uh, kids of color are taken out of home. Thank you. Uh, hold on. The, the decorum of the Senate is that we stay quiet in the gallery. Thank you. Uh, this is cool. But um, if you could, and I didn't want to interrupt your speech to say that at the time, but so thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> were there any other? OK, so I had a question as well. Um, you mentioned some of the financial impacts and where some of the funding came, came from. In the report, it was on page 23, some of that breakdown. Because uh, we are going to be talking later today about the dual tracks that when a uh, child report comes in, whether it goes into an assessment track or an investigation track. And one of the concerns I've heard is that maybe some cases that should be investigations, a more thorough look at what's going on, end up in assessment possibly because of funds. Um, so could you please break down between federal, state, and local funds how some of those different pieces of the puzzle are coming together, please. Thank you very much for the question, uh, Madam Chair. Um, the, uh, so there are, um, there's a lot, of, a lot of different money that goes toward child protection. Um, and the money that comes from the federal government and the state government um, is often directed toward particular things. You know, we fund this, we don't fund that. We fund that, we don't fund this. Um, whatever doesn't get funded by the state and federal government ends up having to be funded locally. Um, and as we show here on, uh, we have on the, on, I'm going to actually, uh, you mentioned page 23, but I'm going to look at the chart on page 22 um, of the report, where we noted that 53% of the funding for uh, children's social services comes from local sources. It's not coming from federal state sources, or uh, and there's a little bit of miscellaneous in there as well. It, it a lot of that is coming from 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 local sources, and so that um, uh, as as I'm sure you are aware, there is an, always uh, 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 an interest in, in getting the state to fund more activity that happens at the local level, um, and this is is no different. Um, there uh, the. Um, and then what uh, we show on page 23 is how there are differences between where the money comes from for certain sorts of things. Uh, to note that, for example, even though there's both federal and state money in the system, that money is directed toward different things in, uh, in terms of how it's, it's sent out. So the federal government actually spends more money on child protection investigation and less money on the bottom item there, which is family-based life management skills, which we might think of as being one of the things uh, that might kind of fit in that prevention bucket, right? Um, whereas the state, in terms of the money that the state puts out, the state uh, spends more money on that family-based life management skill side of things and less money on investigation. Now, part of that might be because of how much, where the federal government is spending money, the state's putting money elsewhere and so forth. But there, and I, I'm really, I think that the counties can really speak to this much more directly than I can about how they have to juggle the various different funding streams that they have available to try and figure out how to fund the important work that they do and whether or not that funding um, uh, influences what particular actions that they take. Um, 
but certainly, I, I don't know if I answered your question, but uh, that was, I, I'm very happy that you pointed out some of those uh, funding pieces that we have in our report, because they are important. So as a follow-up, um, because Minnesota has more of a county-based than a state-based system, is it the possibility that there are some counties, whether it's just for what they have from a tax pool or how they're choosing to invest their money, there could be a, a big disparity in how much money is being put into some of the child-related services? Um, I believe that is, that is most likely the case. I can't say that with um, certainty, but I will also note and this is particularly important when we're talking about smaller counties, is that the need changes quite dramatically from year to year. Okay, so if you're in a small county with you know, 11,000 people and you have one family with four kids that you have to have an emergency intervention for, all of a sudden your budget might skyrocket. I mean, you know, you're, you're, you, you might, that might be, uh, you, you might have gone by up by 50% of the number of kids that you're dealing with in a small county. So you, there are fluctuations that small counties have to deal with from year to year that uh, are less of an issue, I think, for larger counties because, you know, a Hennepin County, a Ramsey County, they have kind of a steady, steady stream of stuff. So. Um, uh, certainly there are differences in terms of the availability of, of, of funding uh, for social services. That's something that we've talked about in many reports over time, not just about child protection, but in, uh, you know, we have a county-based social services system, and that's certainly something that our office has talked about in many reports. Um, but I think particularly in this sphere, it's also worth noting not just those differences between counties, but even those differences between years can be uh, sometimes challenging for counties to manage. Thank you very much. Representative Pinto. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. So I have a, 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 question, a question and a comment, and I, I'm aware of wanting to get to other things on the agenda, so I'll try to be quick and ask you as well. But if you can go to slide 16, which is outcomes following holds vary. Yeah. Um, and uh, I just, um, do we have an insight as to why? I could imagine looking at the, the range between counties, if there's one county in your chart that hardly any emergency holds don't result in out-of-home placement, another county that more than a third. Um, do we have any insight into why that disparity of what's happening in different counties, or is the challenge just such a lack of data that we just, just don't know? Uh, Mr. Christian. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and thank you for the question, uh, uh, Representative Pinto. I, um, I, I wish I could give you more detail. And one of the things, honestly, that made it more challenging to look at this more closely was just simply not knowing who was even doing the emergency holds. Um, like it, it, as I said, you know, Washington is kind of an outlier on this thing, but I don't know who's doing those emergency holds, whether it's City of Stillwater Police or whether it's Washington County Sheriff's Office or it's all of the above. Um, and, um, and so that makes, it, um, that makes it a little bit challenging. There are multiple stories that you could tell from the information on this slide, and we're not quite sure which one that they are, without doing a deep, deep dive into an individual county. You know, is it the case, for example, in Washington County that they're removing an awful lot of kids from homes that didn't need to get removed in the first place? Or is it, or is it the case that they have such a good system of support services that are available once a child has been removed that they're able to return many more kids that other counties aren't able to? I don't know the answer to that question. I'd love to be able to provide it. But with, without doing a really, really deep dive and just like spending a, bunch, you know, a couple of months just looking at Washington County, which we didn't have the ability to do, answering that kind of question is difficult. And you could say the exact same thing for Beltrami County on the other side of the spectrum. Is it the case that they're really, really careful and they only ever remove a child you know, when it absolutely is necessary and the court always agrees, or is it the case that they sometimes don't remove children when maybe they should be because they, like every time they do it, 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 it goes forward. Or is it the case that you have courts there that just always do whatever, they always you know, back up whatever is done by local officials? And so, I mean, there are so many different stories that you could tell with the information here, and we don't know which one of them are, is true, but we do know that the, the, the difference we think is worth noting and worth uh, paying attention to. Representative Pinto. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And then just the comment, and I had the benefit, Representative Hanson did as well, I guess, of hearing you, I think our, our one of our very first meetings of my committee this mm -hmm. year, you presented, and thank you for that. Um, I remember thinking at the time, and even more now, when I look at the key recommendations, they feel pretty narrow, to be to be honest. So the only one to the legislature is just that we should direct child protection agencies to produce 
short, easy to understand summary documents for parents, which seems important. Um, I wonder if, if at this point, are there broader recommendations that you, I mean, it seems like there was a constraint that you were under because this federal law was, was enacted at the time. Um, but just given the importance of removals or, or reunifications, maybe just the comment that I at least, and I suspect others as well, would welcome if there are broader recommendations beyond just that we direct agencies to produce short summary documents. Um, I think we'd, we would certainly welcome those um, recommendations. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the comment. Uh, oh. Madam Chair, if, if I could, thank you so much. Um, I do want to emphasize the recommendations about law enforcement um, because I really think that that's an area where I felt like our report took a real close look at the role of law enforcement with regard to the child protection system in a way that people don't often do. People kind of focus on the child protection agency side of things, and they play very important roles. But in Minnesota, it is law enforcement that has the ability to remove a child from the home. It is not the child protection agency. and so. Uh, encouraging DHS to bring recommendations to the legislature. So we are actually recommending legislative action there. We just didn't feel like able to, re to make a specific recommendation for what that should be. But encouraging DHS to, bring rec uh, to convene a working group to bring recommendations to the legislature about law enforcement training and about thinking about the role of law enforcement is, I think, very important. Um, another thing I will note is that there are a number of things that just because we there were things that we noted, but that didn't rise to recommendation because we weren't confident that we necessarily get better outcomes. You know, should it be the case that Minnesota allows child protection agencies to remove children from the home and not have it just be law enforcement? There are plenty of other states that do that. We don't have any confidence that we would get better outcomes from that. So, but I think that's a conversation worth having. We don't make a recommendation about that. But we did note, for example, in the report, something that we thought was very interesting, that um, when we asked this question, because we surveyed both law enforcement agencies and child protection agencies, and we asked this question, should Minnesota child protection agencies have the ability to remove children from the home? And fascinatingly, the majority of child protection agencies said no, and the majority of law enforcement agencies said yes which was, I thought, a really interesting kind of insight into the fact that nobody really wants to make these decisions <laughs> um, because they're hard and because when mistakes are made, terrible consequences ensue. And it's very, very difficult what we ask folks to do out in the field. Thank you for that. I, I will say that um, looking at high contact mandated reporters and how they're trained in general is something I, even before this, had already been interested in, including law enforcement. And we talked about maybe addressing that in a future task force or in, in one of our future meetings. So I appreciate that. Um, seeing no other questions and wanting to keep our agenda on time, I greatly appreciate um, your time here today. Um, but I am going to excuse you and I am going to turn it over to uh, Commissioner Jody Harpstead, um, who wanted to have the opportunity to make a couple comments. And then after that, we will continue on to a DHS presentation um, about intake, and then after that, um, more from the dual track system from our counties. Commissioner Harpstead, at your convenience. Thank you so much. Uh, Chair Mitchell, Chair Pinto, and members, I'm Jody Harpstead, Commissioner of the Department of Human Services. Thank you for the opportunity to provide a few brief opening remarks on this very important issue. The Department of Human Services is the state agency charged with overseeing the child protection system in Minnesota. As you've heard, like some nine other states, we administer a state-funded, county, and tribal-administered continuum of human services for Minnesotans. The death or abuse of any child is a tragedy for our communities. Our entire human services system throughout Minnesota is committed to child safety. It is also committed to keeping families together wherever feasible. This is delicate and difficult work. Our county social workers and judges must balance when to keep a family together, when to remove children from home, and whether they should be reunited. Social workers and judges make their best decisions one family at a time based on the information available to them at the time. To get a full picture of Minnesota's performance on child protection, we look at a broad constellation of factors. We believe we must always work to improve our system because every statistic represents a child who deserves safety. 
Minnesota's had a reduction in the recurrence of child maltreatment in general, which has been below the national average for the past three years. We've also had an enviable record of movement out of foster care to permanency and permanency stability well above national averages for some years. And there are areas of concern. Our rate of return to foster care is higher than the national average, for example. We continue to learn and look for the best approaches to giving kids the best start. Since the previous Child Protection Task Force made their recommendations, there's also more and more research about the lifelong trauma caused by separating children from their parents, even imperfect parents. We continue to be concerned about the racial bias still very present across Minnesota about what constitutes a proper home for children to grow up in, the racial bias in the children who experience out-of-home placement, and the bias in the homes that are chosen for permanency. We all need to be concerned about equity in out-of-home placement as well as child safety. This task force heard data about these disparities last year. They persist today. And of course, we hope that the historic investments made by the legislature in this past session will move the needle on reducing systemic racism and its resultant intergenerational child poverty and therefore childhood trauma. I'm grateful to the governor and lieutenant governor for appreciating the need to support the child protection workforce with their advocacy for additional funding to reduce caseloads. That can only help give these frontline workers the time and space they need to gather information and offer their best judgments to the courts. And we're working with our county partners, AMC and MAXA, to host a meeting soon where child protection workers can support each other in their work and we can all discuss how we can continue to improve outcomes. We'll gladly share the outcome of that discussion with this task force if you choose as you continue to do your own examination of future options for this work. I'm sure you'll want the input of the people doing this work on the ground in Minnesota as well as the opinions of experts from other states. I certainly hope that after some additional examination of how our system works, we'll end up together in the place where our county social workers and judges can continue to stand for both child safety and family preservation making difficult judgments based on the information they have, now with fresh new insights from their own discussions and your deliberations. Minnesota and all of its systems continually improve as we work together. I know we will all treat this conversation with the curiosity, sensitivity, and compassion that our children and families deserve. Thank you for your time and attention to this critical and sensitive space in our statewide human services system. I'll stop here and yield to the DHS team with the expert information that you asked to focus on in today's meeting. Thank you, Commissioner. And yes, we would like the outcome of, of any of that information that you Madam Chair, obtain. Certainly. Is there a possibility for me to ask a quick question of the Commissioner, please? Yes, Representative, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair and Co-Chair Pinto. Thank you so much for being here. And um, you know, we've all been pretty shocked by the the reports that we've been reading, which is a reason why we are probably meeting first time since 2022, so it's good to be back. But truthfully, we need to know what's going on. And so um, I'm hoping that our task force today and our future task force uh, meetings, we're able to get some answers from D um, MDH about what is going on, what the, the reports that we're hearing from the media is that there is some pressure from MDH to our local counties. And I want to know what's happening with that, who is pressuring our counties to go against their better judgment, and who at the Walls Administration is saying that these are okay to do. And so, Madam Chair, I know we might not have answers right now from the Commissioner, but I think it's really important that people are held accountable as we have some horrific um, reports that there is some lack of oversight, lack of leadership, lack of whatever it is that are resulting in children dying. And as you said, one children dying is too much. And so I, we would like to know what is happening so that we can prevent that. And no system is perfect, but that we can prevent that as much as possible in the future. Thank you, Madam Chair. Re you said there was a question. Was there a question in there? Well, I guess I can ask my two questions. I don't know if I'll get an answer right away. But um, my two questions are, who at the Department of Human Services is pressuring our local child protective services to ignore their best judgment to derail child protective investigations? 
and who within the Walls administration developed or endorsed the use of this policy? Those are the two questions that I would like to be answered. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner. Yes, Chair Mitchell and, uh, and uh, member, uh, we have no practice in the Department of Human Services of pressuring our counties to go against their better judgment. And there is no uh, policy in the Walls administration to do such a thing. As, I, as I've said, we appreciate that our counties um, and, our, and our judges are making their best decisions at the time with the information that they have available. We have plenty of conversations across the human services system about the ways that we can continually improve our system. And we are open to having that conversation with our counties to understand what barriers they face or what other issues they see on the ground that they could imagine would help them do their work uh, better and get even better outcomes. Thank you, Commissioner. Seeing no other questions, uh, thank you for your time. And we would now like to call up the um, DHS team to present the Minnesota Child Maltreatment Inc. Take screening response path guidelines. Uh, Bharti Wai is who I have for that. I will let you introduce yourselves because, and Rebecca Wilcox, just to make sure um, I'm saying the names correctly and that we have everything at your convenience. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, good afternoon. My name is Barty Wahi. I'm the Deputy Assistant Commissioner of Children uh, for Children and Family Services at the Department of Human Services, and I'm acting interim co-director of our Child Safety and Permanency Division. Uh, with me today is my colleague Rebecca Wilcox, the Safety and Prevention Manager for Child Safety and Permanency. We've been asked to provide the task force with an overview of Minnesota's child maltreatment intake, screening, and response path guidelines, most recently updated in October of this year. Um, I just wanted to check to make sure that uh, folks online can see the... I, I can see it on the Zoom. Okay, excellent. Thank you. So thank you. Um, I would like to take a moment uh, first to echo the Commissioner Harpstead's remarks. Every child, every young person is precious, and the department takes child safety in all its facets seriously. Uh, as our colleagues in the OLA said today, the child welfare system is complex, and we all, share an, uh, we all have a shared accountability for the safety of children and young people in our community. We appreciate the opportunity to work with the Legislative Task Force and many other people as we grapple with this complexity and identify areas for increased resources, streamlining, and improvement. As we uh, jump into our presentation, uh, we wanted to focus first on a, a brief um, overview of the system itself and then jumping straight into our, the information on the guidelines. Um, the public welfare, uh, public child welfare system operates at the federal, state, and local levels, as our colleagues in the OLA mentioned. Additionally, many uh, private and community-based organizations are involved in providing for a child's, well, a child's well-being. The child welfare system varies from state to state, and I think we heard about that earlier. Minnesota is, as stated, one of nine states organized um, as a state-supervised and county and tribally administered system. The other states are Colorado, California, New York, North Carolina, North, Do North Dakota, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Vir and Virginia. Nevada and Wisconsin have hybrid systems, which means that they are administered partially by state and partially by local units of government. The department works very closely with our county partners as well as tribal partners uh, as we um, provide programs and services to children uh, and families throughout the state. The, role, uh, the department's role in the delivery of most child welfare services is indirect, and the role of counties and tribes is to provide direct services to children and families. The department works most directly and reports to the U.S. Federal um, Department of Health and Human Services to ensure Minnesota is in compliance with federal program policies, fiscal policies, processes, and requirements. So in addition to those that were mentioned, um, uh, the while we, the state works with counties, tribal nations, county attorneys, and the judiciary, and all play a significant role in the child welfare system, there are other important community partners whose input is essential to the operating a complex system. These partners include the families themselves, 
community, mandated reporters, foster care providers, attorneys for parents and children, and law enforcement. The child welfare cases require highly skilled workforce and coordination to ensure that there are individualized responses that best meet the needs of all children, young people, and families. The department's primary responsibilities include establishing policies and procedures and processes for statewide implementation of the child welfare practice, providing guidance, consultation, training, and technical assistance to local agencies, monitor monitoring county and tribal compliance with state and federal child welfare requirements and performance measures, issuing grants and allocations to counties, tribes, and community agencies and providers to support in the delivery of child welfare services. In addition, the department is responsible for collecting and sharing reports and data with the legislature and with the public, providing information systems and technology to document and meet federal reporting requirements, and then working with our Child Welfare Training Academy as well as the Minnesota Supreme Court on the Children's Justice Initiative. The child welfare system is a group of public and private services that are focused on ensuring that children live in safe, permanent, and stable environments that support their well-being, including the prevention of child abuse and neglect, family preservation and support services, child protection, in which government social uh, service agencies receive maltreatment reports, conduct investigations and assessments, provide treatment and intervention services um, to children and families foster care, including relative foster care and children's residential placement, adolescent services for older youth um, and those transitioning out of foster care, kinship and adoption, as well as the Indian child welfare, giving tribal governments strong voice in child welfare proceedings that involve American Indian children. The department and our collaborative partners in the counties, tribes, and community are focused on increasing access to prevention services and supports, including concrete supports to families experiencing deprivation. National data indicates children are safest when investments are made in children and families, reducing trauma and the need for out-of-home placement. We appreciate the OLA's highlight of prevention services, and the department is committed uh, to working on uh, ensuring that we have strong upfront systems. We look forward to the opportunity to discuss that with this legislative uh, task force in the future. The child welfare services rely on a, on a constellation and a combination of federal, state, county, local community, and tribal government funding. Much of Minnesota's system is funded by county social service agencies through property tax le levies with state grants and allocations for a handful of specific purposes, including newly established state investments in prevention activities and allocations recommended by the 2015 task force that could be used to hire child welfare staff and, protect and expand child protection services. Title IV-E reimbursement offsets child welfare costs, and that's federal funds. Title IV-E is part of the Social Security Act and provides reimbursement for direct cost of paying for foster care, kinship and adoption assistance, training for the child welfare workforce, and foster and adoptive families, as well as administrative and systems costs. Other federal funding includes Title um, IV-B, which provides funding to states to support prevention of removals and reunifications. Title 20, the social service block grant that provides states with funding for the protection of vulnerable children and adults. And the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, which provides funding to support a variety of child welfare activities, as well as Medicaid. I want to highlight that um, a, a, a recent Child Trends report that offers that the share of federal funding for child welfare costs has decreased over the past decade due to a number of factors, including decreases to the social service block grants to states, and that funding sources, for, funding sources such as 4B um, haven't increased, so they've lost their value. I also wanted to share that in that, in a, in that report, nationwide in 2020, the, chair, the share of child welfare costs paid by state, local, and federal funds averaged 52% for federal funds, 48% for state funds, and 10% for local. In Minnesota, our funding well, uh, uh, for child welfare is 31% from federal sources, 25% from state, and 44% from local governments. 
Among available data on states with local administered systems, only the states of North Carolina and Ohio provide funding at a lower level than Minnesota does. The child, wel child welfare funding is complex and requires a thorough understanding of how these funding sources work together. Greater resources are needed to support children and families as well as the child welfare workforce. Now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Rebecca Wilcox um, for, uh, to speak more specifically about the guidelines. Thank you, Ms. Wilk Mel I'm sorry, Ms. Wilcox. Thank you, Barty. Chairs and members, I'm Rebecca Wilcox. I'm the manager of child safety and prevention for child safety and permanency here at Department of Human Services. Minnesota screening guidelines, best practice guidance, and training are built on a safety framework. The framework is centered on several important goals improving screening guidelines and practices, examining a continuum of child protection responses and allegations of maltreatment, reducing racial disparities, providing training, overseeing county performance, ensuring transparency, and providing adequate resources. Next slide, please. Along with implementing specific recommendations from the 2015 task force, the department began working with the National Capacity Building Center for States on outlining a plan for strengthening Minnesota's child safety framework. This included many activities. Initially, the department conducted focus groups, engaged with tribes, and analyzed data in new ways. What we understood from our engagement and data analysis was a lack of clarity in our safety framework, and that supporting the workforce was not just about training, though an important component. It was about clear policy and supervision through coaching and ongoing support. Since then, an improved articulation of Minnesota's safety framework has been developed along with safety practice profiles, a workforce support tool. The goals of the safety framework include child welfare staff will make consistent safety decisions across the life of the case with fidelity to the model or consistent with guidelines and standards of the state. Child welfare staff will be supported by their supervisor and agency to make these safety decisions and that supervisors will support their child welfare staff through coaching in making these safety decisions across the life of the case. We know that defining safety can be difficult and outcomes can look different in every case. Most parents want to keep their children safe and sometimes circumstances or conditions interfere with their ability to do so. This is also a challenge for child welfare professionals who are tasked with making safety decisions in partnership with children, families, and many other systems. We also know that workers suffer from high burnout rates, fatigue, second guessing, and intense public scrutiny, all which can lead to inconsistencies in practice. Within the context of the larger Minnesota Child Welfare Practice Framework, the safety framework focuses specifically on child safety and aims to define practice and promote consistency across the state. The child safety framework outlines a shared set of principles, guidelines, and practice tools designed to support child welfare professionals. The idea being that when we share a consistent framework for practice and engagement, we will have more consistent outcomes. In an effort to strengthen our safety framework and influence practice, we recognize the department's responsibility to invest in and provide updated practice guidance, updated tools, worker and supervisor training centered in the safety framework and safety practice profiles, supervisor coaching training, motivational interviewing training, and fidelity monitoring, which ensures that the work is completed in accordance to the model that the state has outlined. Next slide. Minnesota's screening guidelines is part of Minnesota's child safety framework rooted in state statute. Minnesota's policy is to protect children whose health or welfare is jeopardized by child maltreatment. In the Maltreatment of Minors Act, Minnesota's statute states, while it's recognized that most parents want to keep their children safe, sometimes circumstances or conditions interfere with their ability to do so. When this occurs, the health and safety of children must be of paramount concern. Intervention and prevention efforts must address immediate concerns for child safety, and the ongoing risk of abuse or neglect should engage the protective capacities of families. Next slide, please. The purpose of the Child Maltreatment Intake and Screening Response Path Guidelines, or the Screening Guidelines, is to provide direction for local welfare agencies to promote statewide consistency in the definition and practice as mandated by state statute. These guidelines also provide information for mandated reporters and the public about the types of child safety concerns that should be reported. Families and communities benefit when child maltreatment screening guidelines are clearly understood and readily available. These guidelines are based on Minnesota Statute 260E or the Maltreatment of Minors Act. 
child protection staff, supervisors, and others involved in child protection intake and screening of reports must follow these guidelines and must immediately implement updated procedures and protocols. The guidelines reiterate state statute outlining which type of allegations may pose higher safety threats to children and must be responded to immediately. The guidelines articulate that if a report meets the state definition of maltreatment, a risk of harm exists. Next slide. The new screening guidelines were introduced in 2015 after a workgroup process developed them based on state and federal law and the recommendations coming out of the 2015 task force. The department held statewide specialized in-person trainings on the guidelines to ensure local agencies understood them and were able to implement them consistently. The department also integrated these into existing trainings for child welfare workers and has provided ongoing technical support since that time. The department also provides rapid consultation for local agency workers needing advice on how to address specific case reports and has supported local agencies in developing screening review teams. Each year, the department updates the guidelines to refine, clarify, and adjust them based on new laws and other circumstances that may arise. As recommended by the 2015 task force, the guidelines are intended to provide a nimbler method of addressing on the ground circumstances than is available through legislation. For example, the department recently adjusted the guidelines to reflect community concerns with a number of maltreatment reports made to local agencies for children experiencing extended stay in hospital settings due to mental or behavioral health crises while their families were searching for appropriate mental health or other care. These children can't safely go home and need services and care, not a child protection investigation. The changes to the guidelines clarify that local agencies may provide services to the families in these situations rather than a child protection investigation. The October update also included necessary changes related to the legalization of cannabis. State law requires that counties follow the screening guidelines. This means that if a local welfare agency wishes to implement, it, implement changes to these guidelines, it may, must first consult with their county attorney and then seek prior approval from their department, from our department. Proposed changes can't be less protective of children than mandated in law and must not limit screened in reports or place additional limits on consideration of screened out reports in making screening decisions. No county has requested local modifications to the state guidelines. Next slide. The screening guidelines focus on child safety, disparities, clarification for agency workers, and promote consistent practice. They provide information on how to collect in intake information and manage multiple reports upon intake and what reports are urgent and require a 24-hour re response. The guidelines also provide information on allegation types and other considerations when making decisions on screening a report in or out. The guidelines provide substantial information for workers when using, for workers to use when de um, deciding whether to report uh, to, screen a, uh, to screen in a report for family assessment, investigation, or facility investigation response path. After my presentation, I understand that county staff will walk through more of details on those response paths. Finally, finally, the screening guidelines provide guidance related to mandated reporters who are the primary source of maltreatment reports to local agencies. Screening guidelines discuss who, when, and where reports should be made. Mandatory reporting includes information is critical because this is at the point where disproportionality in child welfare begins. In recent years, the department has made improvements to the mandatory reporter guide, which is separate from the screening guidelines, and developed updated mandatory reporter training to address bias in reporting. There is a three-step process for local agencies when a report of alleged maltreatment is made. Intake, which is the process of receiving a report. Screening, which is the process of determining whether a report meets the state's, state's threshold for child protection response. And response path assignment. If a report is screened in, a pathway assignment is made based on the location of the alleged maltreatment, whether it happened in a family or facility setting, and the type of allegation. Next slide. To ensure child safety is paramount when screening reports in or out, workers or screening teams consider whether the allegations in a report, if true, describe circumstances that would meet the statutory definition of maltreatment. For a report to be screened in, it must include sufficient identifying information to attempt to locate the child or at least one member of the family 
and that child maltreatment allegations must not have been previously assessed or investigated. Next slide. Reports can be screened out for a few reasons, including but not limited to the allegation does not meet statutory maltreatment criteria, there's not enough identifying information about the child or family, the same allegations were previously assessed or investigated, the case is not in the local agency's jurisdiction, which means that those cases will be referred elsewhere, the report does not allege child maltreatment in the child's family unit or covered licensed facility. In some cases, reports are requ required to be sent to law enforcement. Screened out reports may also be referred to parent support outreach or other child welfare services for further follow-up. This graphic sh shows um, a de depiction of the child welfare process. Um, on the far left shows prevention. Prevention is aimed at supporting families prior to report of child protection. To the right of the report, the graphic shows the child welfare process. Screening, screened in reports are at the top and screened out reports are on the bottom. Next slide. This slide provides information on date, uh, data on screening. The figures are from 2021. Preliminary figures from 2022 are essentially unchanged from 21 and will be included in our next annual report upon completion. You can see that the primary reason for screening out reports is that the allegation does not meet statutory threshold for maltreatment, about 90%. Determining whether to screen out, to screen a report in or out is another point of the system where decisions are made that result in disproportionate overrepresentation of families and children in our child welfare system. 40% of white children are screened in versus about 50% of children of all other races. <clears throat> Next slide, please. The goals of child protection responses are to make child safety paramount and the forefront of decision making. Ass assess and assure safety of the child initially and ongoing during in involvement. Gather facts to help decide if a child has experienced harm and provide needed services. Identify family strengths to help address risks and ensure child, child safety. Affirm a family's cultural beliefs. Coordinate and monitor services to families, including the use of trauma and culturally informed interventions. And promote child, children's well-being and, and permanency. Next slide. As noted before, county staff is here to provide more detailed information on family assessment and family investigation. At a high level, there are clear guidelines on which each should be used. Family assessments are designed to respond to reports that are, do not involve substantial child endangerment, sexual abuse, or ser situations of serious harm. Examples of appropriate cases are first-time reports of educational neglect, unmet basic needs, or substance addiction by a caregiver who has acknowledged the need for help. Family investigations are designed to respond to the most serious reports of harm, neglect to, to children, including substantial child endangerment and sexual abuse. Family investigations may also involve situations where there is not serious harm alleged, but there are additional considerations or vulnerabilities that indicate the need for an investigative response. Next slide. The final slide includes links to a variety of policy and practice guides that were created in response to the 93 recommendations and are used to guide upfront child protective responses. They include the screening guidelines as well as best practice guides and resources. If you'd like to dig deeper into this work, you might find it helpful to review some of these resources. Next slide, please. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. Assistant, Deputy Assistant Commissioner Wahi and I are available for questions. Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and take chair privilege and start asking my questions. Um, and I have a few. Um, first, if, if it, you said that um, if someone has been previously investigated, it would be screened out. But is there a number where, for example, a, a situation has been reported 10 times or there have been a report of 20 times? I mean, do we have a threshold at which point we say, maybe we should take another look? Thank you. Uh, I can address that question, um, Madam Chair. Uh, so if it's already been assessed or investigated means that the exact same allegation um, of the incident has already been assessed or investigated. So there, there may be ongoing reports of neglect or physical abuse 
that are new allegations, now those would be potentially screened in depending on if they meet the threshold for statutory, um, according to statutory guidelines. Um, if there have been reports, so I grew up like two blocks from a different county. So let's say a family has reports in one county and then moves those two blocks. Do the fact that there is a history of reports, does that transfer? Is there any way for counties to know like, hey, this has been an ongoing problem or does a family essentially kind of get a clean slate because we're on a county system? Thank you, Madam Chair. The SSIS, um, the social service information system that um, county workers do use um, does display information from county to county. So there are some limitations in, in which you have to request access um, to certain case details, but they are visible and the, the county perhaps will be able to, the county workers may also be able to describe that a little bit better. Okay, thank you. Um, within the screening guidelines, because we kind of have an, a, a, a track that's a little more an assessment and one that's more of an investigation, is there anything that would trigger a, this must always have an investigation, like sexual abuse? Or is it possible that even what I would consider serious allegations could end up in an assessment track? Thanks for the question, Madam Chair. Uh, like I said um, and during my presentation, all allegations of substantial child endangerment, serious injury or harm, and sexual abuse reports will have to be initially screened um, for an investigation, and the system, our SSIS um, information system, will enforce that as well. Thank you very much for going with all of my questions. Um, on <clears throat> page 19 of your slides, uh, the report goes into the screened in and screened out. But some of what is, it looks like screened out would, are these programs that would still go to parental support, child welfare, or referred elsewhere? So you could be screened out, if I'm reading this correctly, but still be getting different types of parental supports? Madam Chair, yes, that's correct. So what sort of supports would a family be? So let me be clear. I've had a lot of people talking to me since we announced that we were gonna be having this meeting and that I was in a chair position. And a couple of the complaints that I got, um, so I can quit asking questions and be a little more direct, um, were that, uh, for example, one example I heard was from a family that, um, it was a friend of the family, but that they had into their foster home taken um, someone on the autism spectrum who also had um, some emotional issues and some occasional violent out outbursts. And they had asked for more supports. They had counseling and other things and they had asked for more supports and they didn't actually end up with more engagement until the child had attacked another child and that child was pushed. And then because there was a physical contact, they ended up in assessment. And they were like, great, we just want more supports. Please give us the additional support so that we can you know, maintain our family. We don't want this to happen. And they didn't get any additional supports. They ended up in assessment, which again, it was physical, so maybe that should have been an investigation, but they didn't actually get the supports. And what I would hate to see happen is a disability child removed because they'd wanted supports and now they're in a foster family but they've faced trauma from being removed and now they're getting the support that we could have given the original family over here or things of that nature. Um, but what I am hearing is that families aren't always, whether it's the original family or the foster family, families aren't always getting the supports they need and so sometimes these cases are escalating to the point where we're now in a more severe phase. Can you speak to that at all, how we can do a better job of supporting families through this process? Um, Chair Mitchell, thank you so much. Um, I, you know, I think what you're highlighting here is um, 
this particular graphic shows you in a sort of idealized way how programs and um, uh, services might move, uh, a family might be able to access them. However, we know that there are substantial shortages in services, particularly, I think, um, uh, services that uh, attend to sort of the intersection of disability, mental health, um, potentially substance abuse. And I think um, we know that access to those services is also um, uh, not the same in different parts of our state, right? So oftentimes, I think you also have a child welfare workforce that wants to make sure, uh, wants to create access points for families to get services. But if there are shortages uh, in their particular area or very long wait lists, right, um, it may be difficult for them to be able to access services. Uh, in, a, in a timely fashion. And I think as the OLA said, there are also timelines in which all are operating, right? Um, and so I think that that's just one, I mean, it's an aspect of the system that I think we grapple with all the time. And, um, you know, this uh, graphic shows you sort of how ideally the screening process and um, if a report is screened in and screened out moves, but I think the reality of it is is that access, access to services is a much more complicated um, uh, strategy than it would seem. Thank you for answering all of those. I want to give other people an opportunity. Senator Hoffman. Thank you. I'm glad you brought that up, uh, Madam Chair. I, it, it just dawned on me as I'm looking at the family well-being piece. Um, Minnesota chose back in 1986 not to do at risk when it comes to early intervention or early intervening services. So we're talking about family supports here, right? Mm -hmm. And when you look at the work of like Dunst, Trivet, and Deal, and those folks, they would always say, you incorporate that family intervening that's holistic, right? And it's there. You can look them up. It's really good stuff. But it's what wrote, and you have the IEIC and follow-along program as far as your family well-being. But Minnesota chose not to do an at-risk state. They chose that early intervention services were only for those children if they qualify for special education and or related services. So they had that piece that was never there. Is there an opportunity for the Department of Human Services to take a larger role when it comes to the early intervention side and, and to start looking at at-risk factors, right? And, and when I use at-risk factors, for example, Indiana, Massachusetts, Hawaii, I'm going to get another one, I can't remember, told, chose in Title IV-E if a child had an at-risk factor for foster care, right? They, they was pretty broad, but they're child find activities were beyond what Minnesota's was when, when you look at birth to three, right? And Minnesota got in trouble from the feds for not identifying children that needed early intervention services birth to one, right? They were cited for that. This is 15 years ago. Why am I remembering this stuff? I don't know, but I am. But my point to you is this, is it perhaps time for us to take a, a, a process back and look at our early intervention access points, right? And you got them all. Kids first, early intervention services, Head Start, early Head Start, all these different access points that are all family-centered when it comes to a child and the, and the whole piece. Is it perhaps time that we take a look at that again from a systems perspective and say, why aren't we looking at those risk factors, right? Indiana, I'm going to give you that one. They had these single points of entry for years that were access points for families and when they did the at risk and their child find activities were four to seven percent. If we did four to seven percent in Minnesota for child find activities, which would get people the supports and services they need, right? It's not mandated, right? It's it's up to the families to decide. You would see a trajectory of less people needing those services as they go on and on. So am I making sense to you when I talk about that systems conversation? Um, yes, um, uh, Chair Mitchell. Um, uh, uh, Senator Hoffman, uh, yes. I mean, I think we would be strong proponents of early intervention access. Um, I, I did want to uplift that uh, we recently submitted a report on the connection between foster care and early childhood, um, uh, the legislative report. Um, so I think it is definitely something that the department is looking at. I think um, also uh, Family First Prevention Services Act really allows us to take a look at both um, how can we um, attend to the continuum far sooner than any um, 
the need for stronger interventions because more serious um, things have happened. Uh, our implementation of Family First has allowed us to take a look at that. I will also say this last legislative session, we were able to really um, identify a number of early intervention efforts, not just in child welfare, but across the human services continuum, right? Investments in concrete supports like childcare, uh, housing, food security, right? Because all of those things make a difference, and particularly for the littlest ones, of course, but I think for all children and young people. But I think it's certainly an interest of the department, um, particularly, uh, and when we know that there is such a strong tie between neglect um, reports and poverty, right? It, we would be remiss not to be looking at the intersection of concrete supports in that way. Thank um, you. For little ones. Madam Chair, as a follow-up. So, um, Yes, I would like to say I think that's an excellent point, and I, I look forward to seeing how that goes down the road because we did invest in you know school lunches, more resources for food shelves, more home security, child care access, early childhood, and I think those things when you uh, take some of those stressors off of families, we have better outcomes down the road when they're able to access those pieces. Yes. I'm glad you brought that up, Madam Chair, because in 1986, the law that said to states, pick your early intervention services, they told the states to be comprehensive, coordinated, and collaborative. It's in, it's in federal law, right? And it's what we're supposed to be doing. And so you bring up the education piece. I think it's also an opportunity for us as we look at this, and, and the folks, uh, when Senator Kroon and I did talk to our folks in Anoka County, they also brought up the fact of where is that conversation of the collaboration between education and human services, and, and really meaningful, purposeful collaboration on that. And I, I would really like to see how that conversation rolls out. And I think you're, you're spot on, and, and how do we make that the systems seamless, right? Because Families or anybody involved in a systems approach should never worry about, well, which agency do I have to go to? Which one am I going to qualify for, right? No, it should be access points, and I like that point. That's what it brought up, and then when you see the family well-being, it all makes sense. So, And there was a book back in 1992. It was a family. It was Supporting and Strengthening Families. It was Dr. Carol Trivet. If anybody wants to look it up, it's actually a good read. So goodbye. Okay. Um, yes, Representative Mueller. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate that. Uh, thank you, DHS, for being here. Um, I did actually want to ask a question as we have been, uh, I have been on the task force now since the very first convening of this at the beginning of, or in the summer of 2022. <laughs> and so, um, I did, at that point, did receive the March 2015 task force uh, recommendations. I was not on that task force at that time. There were 93 recommendations from that, and I wanted to know, I don't remember ever seeing uh, a report of seeing how these had been implemented. So if you could uh, uh, let me know how many have been implemented at this time. I did hear you talk about because of the 2015 task force, we had changed some of our screening processes and screen in and screen out. You know, we're hearing from the most current media reports that we are one of the highest states that screen out people and, and some of that stuff has has led to tragic ends. And so um, obviously we needed to look at what we're doing here. So um, from the 2015 task force, how many have of the 93 recommendations, which I know that's a ton and takes a while to do, but how many of them have been implemented and uh, or at least at some form have been implemented. So representative, um, I do believe that was covered in one of the task force meetings last year, September. Uh, Chair Pinto. Um, and, and Madam Chair, not to, and, and I, um, just, to, just to know for Representative Mueller and all, so actually the most recent meeting of the task force, the final one in that series, um, there was a presentation by the agency on um, the, uh, at least I believe that there was, on the, um, uh, the um, task force recommendations from 2015. Um, and that's, it's included, if you look at the meeting materials of September of 22, it was kind of included in our meeting materials. So in any case, oh. I mean, they may have more to add, but just to make yeah. sure to clarify. Yes, yeah, so if, if you have anything to add, but um, obviously so, this was a, like an hour long 
presentation and Madam Chair, we have Chair, Chair Pinto, thank you so much. I, I, I do see it in my notes because you know me, Chair Pinto. I keeps crazy notes, and so I do see it. I, I do see of uh, areas that I have looked at. I didn't see a specific number, which is again, that's how that works. But this is also from 2022, and hopefully from then we've had more that has been implemented. That is at least the hope. So if we have an update on that, that would be fantastic. Thank you, Chair. Or yes. Madam Chair. Um, if, if you have any response to that, and um, uh, just in general, I would like to keep kind of the rest of this to maybe only five or ten minutes um, because I do want to give time to our last presenter today. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, Representative Mueller. Um, uh, yes, the 2014-2015 uh, Governor's Task Force on Child Protection issued a report that included the 93 recommendations. Um, recommendations cover um, uh, maltreatment report screenings, investigation, family assessment, racial equity and disparity reduction, training, oversight of county performance, transparency and uh, the adequacy of resources. Um, you know, I think the department has made a number of um, of, uh, has made significant progress in a number of areas. Uh, I, just very briefly, for the, in the interest of time, um, I think we have heard today about the screening guidelines and uh, that body of work, it represents a pretty significant shift for us here in the state and we continue to impl uh, implement some in those areas. Um, there are a couple of things that were updated from last year, including um, sort of uh, finalizing the safety practice pr framework and this beginning of training, particularly for supervisors in our system. Um, I would also highlight, you know, we have several partnerships. Uh, we have a partnership with the University of Minnesota in our Minnesota Child Welfare Training Academy that really addresses how to support the workforce in a more uh, comprehensive way. Um, and then I would also say, you know, we've been undertaking a number of efforts to address disparities, um, uh, working both with our tribal nations and then standing up um, an American Indian well-being unit as well as our African American well-being unit to address disparities. Um, uh, Representative Mueller, I'm happy to provide. Uh, we have a, a table in which we have some updates on those re on those recommendations, and happy to provide that to you. Thank you, uh, Senator Kern. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we, we have a fairly, seems to me, complicated funding structure here, where we have three governmental entities primarily that fund the system as a whole, and um, it's always somewhat dangerous when a lawyer gets into math here, but. I'm going to make an attempt anyway. Um, so if I've heard you correctly, and please correct me if I'm wrong, you said that uh, your statistics were that it breaks down 31% federal, 25% from the state. And I believe you said then, if my math is correct, 44% would then come from the county. Um, and if I am correct on that, that those percentages uh, differ from um, testimony the OLA just made earlier today, which had 53% coming from the county, 23% from the federal government, 21% from the state. Now, the OLA's numbers are from 2019. I don't know where your numbers, but can you explain the difference, um, if I'm correct, number one, and if I am correct, what, what the difference is? Um, Ms. So Why? I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Um, yes, uh, Senator, um, we, uh, the information that we got was from a report um, conducted by Child Trends. Um, and it was uh, a, a an assessment of sort of like the sort of breakdown of state and local and federal funds. Um, we can, ha I'm happy to provide the link uh, to the committee if that would be really helpful. But we know that um, one of the changes, there are a couple of changes that have happened since that time. Um, but I think one of the things that I would say is um, uh, Family First Prevention Services uh, Act has become more fully uh, fully integrated into the state. And um, and as I said, we'll, ha we'll make sure to bring the, um, we'll provide the link for the child trends data to the committee. Thank you. Senator Kern. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, I, I guess I'm assuming that the OLA's numbers were, I'm not sure that they probably didn't come from some outside organization. I would imagine they were pretty accurate, but setting that aside, um, and when we do, Minnesota is one of nine states that um, relies primarily on counties to administer this plan. And in their, under either statistic, the county is 
um, the majority of the funding sources for the system. So when you say, I'm just trying to get my head around the funding on this, when you say that only North Carolina and Ohio provide funding at lower levels in Minnesota, are you talking about state funding or are you talking about combined funding? Um, uh, Ms. Wai. Uh, Chair Mueller, um, Representative Corn, yes, um, I'm talking about state funding in that. I will say that I think that it is a in complicated intersection of funding, right, at the state, local level. I also think that um, there are other, there's other funding here that's probably not fully represented. Um, we heard about local law enforcement being another area, right? So I, I think that there are opportunities to dig further into that, both the percentages, but also what does that look like as a whole? Right, that is, I think, an opportunity for both maybe this legislative um, task force as well as the department. Senator Kern. Thank you, Madam Chair. One final question here. Um, and, and you may not be the best person to answer that, and feel free to tell me that if that's the case. Um, I know we're, ta we're here talking about intake screening and response path guidelines, but uh, given what's going on in the news, I thought I'd ask this question of you, and, and uh, perhaps it's better asked to our next person or someone else, and you can tell me that. But um, the news stories uh, seem to indicate that, um, they intimate anyway, that um, caseload for uh, social workers or case managers, if you will, um, are above the recommended, recommended level from the last 2015 task force, which is, I believe, 10 um, active files at any given time. And the news story talked about how anecdotally it seemed to me that some case managers had upwards of 20. And I'm just wondering how we get hard data to know what the actual number is statewide on average. If you have that information, um, it seems like we shouldn't be shooting in the dark here. We should be working with actual figures and know what that number is. And I'm just wondering who the best person is uh, to get that information from. Thank you. I think Ms. Why? Yeah, um, uh, Chair um, and Senator, um, uh, you know, I think that's a great question and I think I'll have to get back to you on that. I don't have that off the uh, tip of my tongue. I think we do know that we are experiencing significant shortages in workforce across um, all of our caring professions, but certainly um, in the case of social work, um, it's a, a trend we that existed prior to the pandemic and I think we've seen some um, exacerbation of that um, post. So, I mean, I think the workforce and the caseload and given the complexity of the decisions individual people are making, these are hard calls at every point. And our workforce lives with these decisions, you know, well into um, the rest of their career. They haunt them. And so I think uh, the examination of caseloads is, I think, a really wonderful opportunity. Uh, as the commissioner mentioned, we'll be hosting a meeting with um, a Chinese, uh, County welfare, uh, child welfare staff, uh, I think, to, to gather more information and are certainly um, in close conversation with our uh, county partners as we continue to, to dig in. There's a lot of variability by county and workforce shortages in rural areas are real, right? So. Thank you. Um, we're about where I want to transition to the county, but we have one last, what I was promised would be a quick question from Re Representative Hansen. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for being here. As some of you know, and I'll just answer a question that was that came up about the numbers, I've been working really closely on monitoring the number of social workers that we are short in the state of Minnesota. We're presently about 16,000 social workers short in the state of Minnesota, and that is growing as we continue on. I've been working on a number of issues, so anybody who's listening or on this task force that's interested in contributing to the workforce needs that we have within social work, I might nerd out and tell you how much I love this issue because it is really critical that we continue to support our counties, our kids, our families, and law enforcement by investing in social workers. Their caseloads are too high and we've seen that over and over. We also um, authorized a study last year to look at the SSIS system to make sure we can do a paperwork reduction and so that it is not as complicated. So across county systems and so on and so forth. So these are conversations that are happening within the social work community at least and I would invite folks to continue to join us in that. These workforce issues will not go away. Uh, we will be pursuing, you know, adding them to the workforce grant program on the Higher Education Committee this year, looking at paying for internships, looking at title protection, looking at making sure we make that licensure exam more accessible. So there is a lot of work happening, and this is the open invitation to this task force and the public to reach out to me if you have more questions about that. Thank you. 
Thank you, Representative, and thank you for the number. Um, thank you both for your time. Um, I appreciate you being here. And at this time, I would like to call up our county representatives, um, Stacy Hennen, uh, the director of the Western Prairie and Traverse County, um, to kind of give us that county level perspective on how all of this is working. And at your convenience, you can introduce yourselves and begin the presentation. Thank you. Ready? Good afternoon, Chair Mitchell, Chair Pinto, and members of the committee. I'm Stacy Hennon. I'm the Human Services Director for Western. Can oh. Maybe just get closer to it. I don't know. I can try that. Does that help? <laughs> all right. My kids would never have accused me of being too quiet, so all right. Um, I'm the director of Western Prairie Human Services, which is comprised of Grant and Pope Counties, and the director of Traverse County Social Services. I'm here representing uh, the Minnesota Association of County Social Services Administrators, or MAXA. Uh, counties really appreciate the opportunity to offer comment and insight into the dual track child protection pathway that exists in Minnesota consisting of family assessment and family investigation. Human service agencies through county boards across Minnesota invest heavily in child welfare services at a local level and want to work cooperatively with the department, the legislature, tribes and partners and stakeholders for the best results of children. Um, in the 22 end of the year since we've been talking about different different fiscal reports and financial reports. I'll just add to the confusion. So the, the Seeger report is the social services expenditures and grant reconciliation report that every single county has to fill out and complete and send in at the end, at the end of every quarter. And the state's expenses go in there, federal revenues, federal expenses go in there. If you look at the 2022 20, end of year Seeger report, it says that counties in children's services, which is primarily child welfare, spent $288 million in this area, the state funded $110 million, and the federal funding the federal federal funding was $138 million. So clearly, um, and that does not include children's mental health or children with disabilities. That is only the child welfare areas and some other very small areas. It's primarily all the services, staffing, and resources that we put into child welfare. We report that every quarter to DHS, who compiles that along with all of their data as well. Um, so certainly, I think that that's, that's a pretty complicated number, but it also is clear that counties have a huge investment in child welfare and have a huge stake in child welfare. Um, I think that we recognize that local investment uh, on infrastructure can create some inequities. We think local, we think infrastructure should be more of a statewide investment versus a local investment so that we have resources across the state of Minnesota for all kids who live all over the state. Um, so I think that that's one of the things that's important. All right, so we're gonna hear, we're here to talk about family assessment and family invest investigation. There's a couple of things that, that we as counties wanna talk about, and one of them is that there are a lot of things about family assessment and family investigation that are the same. The time to completion is the same. We have 45 days to complete it, um, no matter which one it is. The same risk assessment and safety tools are all completed for an assessment or an investigation, no matter what, and they're the same ones. All parties are required to be interviewed. There there are some differences in how they're interviewed, and I think that that, that kind of strikes at the heart of it sometimes. But I also want to be clear that so an investigation has to be recorded and, and people are interviewed separately, and it's very formal because you have to make a maltreatment finding that has to stand up if it's appealed. Um, whereas a family assessment, which doesn't make a maltreatment finding, can interview the family members together, and we do sometimes. If our report is an ed neglect, a first time ed neglect, if our report is a, is a food insecurity or a, you know, a housing issue, it makes sense to go through the house and talk to everyone at once. But when you do an, a family assessment, you still can speak to children separately from adults and do frequently. DHS actually did put guidance together several years ago after the first task force that kind of laid that out for counties. And it does in there indicate that, that just because you're doing a family assessment, 
assessment does not mean that the children are not spoken to privately and separately. They are. In our county, I know that they are often because I'm, we're small enough that I'm still involved in those kinds of conversations. So, I mean, I think that, you know, when you look at things like inadequate food or poverty-related things, those are things that family conversations are, just, are, are probably a little bit softer and easier to have than interviews that are set up in a more structured way. Um, all of them focus on child safety and strengthening families. We want to create safety when and if possible within families. Um, a CHIPS or a Child in Need of Protection or Services, so a court petition, can be filed from either kind of assessment. It doesn't make a difference if you do a family assessment or a family investigation. If, you, if, if something in there meets the threshold of a CHIPS, it can be filed and you can take that step forward. Um, and all child protection is a non-voluntary response. So there's no difference between family Family assessment and, um, and family investigation in that respect. They're, they're both non-voluntary. So some of the um, facts about PATH assignment that we want to talk about. So um, several years ago, the definition of a report was changed in statute to meet our federal guidelines. When that change occurred, it became clear that it was clearly defined that the timeline to see an alleged victim is 24 hours in a family investigation and 120 hours in a family assessment, and that begins at the receipt of the report not at the time that we screen it. So there's been conversation about how much we do before we, um, before we assign a pathway to a, to a case. And I think that there's a desire sometimes for us to do a lot of research and information first. And I think our intake process is really robust. I've, I've been a part of it. I've sat through it. I know what we collect. So I think it is really robust. And we have the ability to contact mandated reporters back and get more questions from them. But if we did not screen the report and assign a pathway immediately, we would essentially be saying we have to respond to everything within 24 hours because that time to completion or time to see the client starts at the time that we receive the report in, which is complicated. But ultimately, um, you know, I think it's always important to remember that we have the ability to switch a case. So if we started at a family assessment, but we get in there and we see that there's much more serious, significant things, or there's no cooperation, um, we can move that to a family investigation. If we start with a family investigation and we get in there and we see that this is not at all what it was appeared, the report did not, you know, didn't have all the facts or wasn't accurate, we can also also move that to a family assessment. Uh, but I think that the reality is the pathway has to be assigned immediately or, or when we screen it because it determines our timeline. And if we drive all of our cases to a 24-hour response, we just heard about the lack of resources that we have in staffing. And it takes a lot more staffing to respond to seven reports at 24 hours than if those, some of those are 120 hours and some of those are 24 hours. So it's important that we make a distinction early on between family assessment and family investigation so that we can properly assign that for timelines. I also think it's important, though, to note that when I look at our cases, and I think this is true statewide, um, just because we have 120 hours doesn't mean we wait 120 hours to see families. Typically, when a case is assigned, we, we make a point to see them as soon as we can. But the 24 hours is very clear and very firm. And so I think that we want to be careful not to drive everything to being a crisis, because when everything is a crisis of that nature, it's impossible for any of it to really be a crisis. And so I think it becomes a problem in prioritizing the work that we do. I think that there are also some uh, common misperceptions about about pathway assignment and how it reflects in the entire child protection system. So if a family investigation path is chosen and child protection services are needed, or if a family assessment is done and, and it's determined that child protection services are needed, the family does, is not required to participate. That's the reality, that a family is not actually re required to participate in services unless we file a CHIPS petition or unless we engage them and they want to cooperate. So one of the, the nice things about family assessment is when you come in there, especially on those areas we talked about before with educational neglect and things of that nature, when you come in with a softer tone and a softer approach, um, it, it engages families to participate more. And so we can hopefully move more of those families into open cases, but none of them are required to. Just because you have a family investigation done and we say, yep, we think services are needed, does not legally require the family to do that. Um, the reality is 
the only way we can legally require it is to file a CHIPS petition. And that's always at the discretion of the county attorney's office. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain something. I, I actually had the privilege of serving on the initial task force for the child protection or the governor's task force. So I've, I've had this conversation a lot of times. And I'm going to explain something that I've explained a lot of times is the task force really focused on intake and screening and pathway assignment, right? So if you look at child protection as a funnel, it focused on the top of the funnel, which is, is really, um, it's, a, it's very important who enters our system and how they enter our system is really important. But what it didn't focus on is the bottom part of the funnel, so the part where you file a CHIPS petition. So the CHIPS statute was not substantively changed. Recommendations were not made. It wasn't assessed or looked at. Um, none of those things were looked at. So what you ended up with was widening the funnel at the top quite a bit, but leaving it in place on the bottom. So um, you have a lot more families coming through for assessments, but you don't necessarily have more families coming through with services, which again goes back to the point that the more we can engage people and the more that we can you know, help them understand a need to, to provide better for their family, the, the more success that we're going to have with families because we don't have any, there's no legal obligation for them to comply simply because we did an assessment or simply because we, we made a maltreatment finding. All of those cases, if a client refuses to go to the county attorney's office for assessment of a CHIPS, and oftentimes, because again, we widen that funnel up here but not down here, oftentimes um, they don't move on to a CHIPS. So I think that that's just a misconception about child protection. Um, I also think, and this was brought up earlier, and it always confuses me that the, the concept that the family assessment is, is, less, is more cost effective or is less expensive. I, I don't find that to be true. My colleagues haven't found that to be true. Um, again, I told you we go through the same exact processes. We have the same exact kinds of things that we're doing. So I, I don't, there's no, um, our staff actually oftentimes will spend more time on those family assessments if we can engage them because we spend more time working on services. It's very common for us to make lots of referrals to community services or to continue on with, with other preventive services when we're doing family assessments because those again are where those food insecurities, housing insecurities, those kinds of things, even educational neglect. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't find that to be true. I haven't ever really understood where that came from. So I, I, if if someone had more information, that'd be great, but from what I see thus far, it doesn't seem to us that it causes, um, that it's less expensive to do a family assessment. So I think we, we look at neglect and the fact that neglect is um, one of the largest reasons for for, for screening in. We talked about that earlier. They discussed it earlier. I, I think you have to take a look at neglect and, can, and recognize that neglect can lead to really poor ends for children. Obviously, we know that children that children can die from neglectful situations, neglectful um, assessments and report, ne neglectful allegations. Um, but the reality is a good portion of neglect issues come from poverty indicators or come from things that really stem from poverty. So if you said to me, we, can you screen someone in because they're poor, I would say absolutely not, you can't. The law actually says that you can't. However, if you look at some of the indicators and what some of the symptoms of poverty, we are screening those things in because they need to be addressed. And so sometimes, it, you know, if you look at it from that perspective, it makes more sense that we are um, screening more into family assessment when they're coming in through neglect. Each state actually defines neglect in their own way and in their own definition. So the data isn't very clear on which types of neglect will potentially lead to more significant issues, which makes it really hard for us to say, well, this neglect could get really bad, but this neglect is really something that can be taken care of here. So I think data is a, is a really large point in this. But if you look at the things that, that we, um, that kind of, come into our system, again, as symptoms of poverty, you look at food insecurity. Food insecurity causes reports of inadequate food in the home, which obviously is neglect. Lack of medical, medical care can lead to reports of people not accessing medical care, not following through with medical care, but all those things can come from things like um, not having adequate health care or not having adequate transportation. 
you know, people who miss medical appointments, um, sometimes educational neglect if you can't get your child to school regularly. The, those can all, they all are lack of transportation can lead to unstable jobs and housing. Lack of childcare can result in supervision issues with older kids staying home to watch younger kids, missing school, um, having appropriate people providing care. And inadequate housing can result in all kinds of school attendance issues. When you, when you don't have your basic needs met, it's really hard to kind of move on to those other things. So while we know that neglect can lead to terrible things and we're not saying that it can't, in the bulk of cases of neglect, what we're really dealing with are symptoms and poverty, uh, symptoms of poverty. And, and I think that, you know, you know, we can move to the next slide and you'll see, well, he has moved because he's ahead of me and that's great. <laughs> you can see that, um, if we really want to significantly decrease, decrease child welfare, what we really need to do is significantly increase economic supports and, and increase things that address poverty but at the core of it. And I'll tell you that you'll also address some of your disparities, your racial disparities in that way as well, because we know that families of color live in poverty more often than families that are that are not, families that are white. So I, I, all of those kinds of things, if you look at that parental resilience and social connections, knowledge of parenting and child development, concrete supports in times of needs, these are things that make a difference between the families that enter into our system and the families that don't enter into our system. So if you have, if you have adequate food and adequate medical care or specialized medical care, legal services, housing assistance, if you have access to all of those kinds of things, you're less likely to enter into the child welfare system. Um, predictors of child welfare involvement are income loss, housing hardship, cumulative material hardship. I would take the, this a step further and say that, that if you address poverty, you will see a decrease in things like domestic violence, chemical dependency, all of those kinds of things that stress families out and that cause stressors on families also cause some of those things. So if we re really, as a state and as a nation, want to look at how we systemically improve child protection, we would look at how we address poverty, because poverty is, is one of the biggest indicators of who enters into our system and who doesn't. I do think, and I think it's really important to note that um, the legislature made lots and lots of very good investments last year in, the, in this last session that we think are positive and we think will help children in poverty. And so that, you know, I think that how that bears out in future years is yet to be seen, but we would certainly support continued efforts like that, continued advances in programming like that, because we think that when children are, are fed and have medical care and their parents are also fed and have medical care, that all the way around families function better. Um, I think it would really be remiss if we did not, counties would be remiss if we didn't talk about racial disparities in our system. Uh, we know that Minnesota has some of the highest racial disproportionality in child protection and child removal in the nation for people of color. Um, child protection screening guidelines were moved into statute after, this, after the governor's task force, and that does eliminate most professional discretion that we can make in areas of screening, and sometimes I, I think there's probably, that, that can be a good thing. However, where it does not help us necessarily is it doesn't take into consideration the bias that exists in reporting. We know that children of color are three to four times more likely to be reported on than children who are white. And so when you take that and you look at the guidelines that say, well, if they're reported on three times or four times or five times, you have to screen it in. What we're really saying is that those racial disproportionalities are going to increase. I will say that, that 10 years ago, counties expressed that concern. We said we have concerns that these changes, some of these changes while very good intentioned, and, and we understand that, um, they, they, they could increase racial disparities, and they have increased our racial disparities. Professional discretion is one of those things that allows us to take a look at those reports and say, those are reports, yes, we've had five or six reports, but let's look at the bias that came into that reporting. When you look at the child protection system, you can't just look at the county social services system. You have to look at all of those people who bring into that system and feed into that system, all of those entities that report. So all of those mandated reports 
supporters, healthcare systems, schools, um, all of those kinds, law enforcement agencies, all those kinds of things. And we we need to be spending our time doing more training and more education on, on racial bias. And on and we need to look at systemic bias and systemic racism if we're really going to take care of and address the racial discrimination or the racial disparities that occur. Um, so I think counties are only one part of the child protection system. Addressing bias and reporting and systemic bias is crucial to ensuring people aren't inappropriately captured in our system because of their race or, those, or their socioeconomic status. So all of that being said, um, Counties have a lot of thoughts on what we would like to partner with you on and what we'd like to do to change the system. Um, we, we believe that everyone working together is a powerful way to work towards protecting children in Minnesota. And we believe that that's something all of us want, that our goals are the same in that. So some of those things would be increased funding and building out of an infrastructure of services. So I think these are things that we've talked about before. Um, that I said earlier, these are things that when the state does these, there's more equity in where they've done. When you rely on local resources to do some of these kinds of things, you run into all kinds of issues that, that address that. And part of that is just their ability and their, their ability to garner and, and harness the type of services and the type of providers needed isn't as great as it is when the state is doing it as a whole. So family resource centers, robust parenting programs, expanding our, our parent support outreach or our voluntary services to older kids, expanding current preventative programs to be used with older children, access to appropriate chemical dependency treatment. And I, I think the last one is near to my heart, embedding successful models like collaborative safety within counties. The last task force, one of the best things that the state of Minnesota did was they brought in collaborative safety to look at our child mortality <laughs> reviews. And collaborative safety as a model is a really good way to, to look at child welfare. Instead of looking at it from a perspective of blame, it looks at it from a perspective of what are the, what are the policies, what are the practices, what are the processes. Um, when we talk about our workforce shortage, it's, it's even harder to get people to do this work if they feel personally accountable every time something happens, if they feel like they, they made a mistake or they did something wrong instead of a system that just doesn't quite work in a way that, that helps us get everything we need to get done done. So I think that collaborative safety is a powerful tool that we could use. Um, we also think that that leads into building a sustainable workforce. So the more experienced, diverse staff we have, the better we're able to practice. Um, I think to do that, you know, we really need to focus on things like retention, education and resources, um, thinking about secondhand trauma for those workers who are out there doing this very difficult work. Those are all areas that would help with our retention. Um, I think we want to look at incentives. We need to you know, go from the very beginning to the very ending. So incentives for people to pursue social work careers and appropriate education pathways for that. Partnership with higher education to recruit candidates, funding to reduce staff caseloads. I want to talk uh, just briefly about the the number, the caseload numbers. So when you talk about a caseload number in child protection, there's, there are some reasons it's really hard to quantify it. One of them is that in child protection, a case is the family. So I can have a worker who has 12 cases, but one of those cases might have six children. And if they have six children and they have, for instance, a mom and two dads, and those kids are in placement, we're doing six out-of-home placement plans for six children plus three for the parents. And I mean, so th that one case really is not equal to a case with one child that's not out of home. And that's one of the reasons it's been really hard, I think, to quantify what the appropriate caseload is, is because it really it, it matters what the dynamics of that case load are, and I think in, in larger counties, they may be able to separate them out, specialize them more, but in smaller counties, there's just not the ability to do that. We don't have that many people. So I think that you know, funding to reduce staff caseloads, embedding self-care, um, the bottom part really struck me that an estimated national average turnover for child, for child welfare workers is approximately 30%. So tell me what organization and what company can run when 30% of your workforce is turning over every year. What we are always doing in child welfare is hiring, is training, is, um, is recruiting, and working on retention because 30% of our workforce is turning over on average. Some places it's higher, some places it's lower. And all of those things we talked about ahead of those, things like um, secondhand trauma, caseloads, all of those things play a huge part in, in that. 
Technology investments, so um, we've talked about our statewide system of technology investments, and I, th I think that good, da good data helps support timeline decision making. Um, the more we can see data, the quicker we can see it, the more we can monitor trends, the more we can support our workforce, the quicker we can see where we may be needing to change how we're doing things and change our adjustment. You, you see that, that October, in October, I believe, the 2021 report came out because we don't have a data system that has real-time data reporting. We don't have a data system that was created to do the kind of data we're asking it to give us now. It was really created to do much more basic things than, it, than what we're asking for it to do. So I, I think that we, we absolutely believe that data, better data leads to an ability to determine your course and path with facts. And we would be very supportive of having, data, of having SSIS be updated or changed, whichever the state and the counties decide to do. Um, I think that a couple of the things that we would need to look at how to capture in those are reporter bias, stigma with racial and economic disparities, all of those things. If we had better real-time data, we could track those things better. We could respond to them faster, and people would be treated better in a quicker time. So more funding for preventive care. We know preventive care works. Chapin Hall research shows that families with screening reports who are sent to family assessment are more likely to receive those concrete supports. Earlier we showed those concrete supports are one of the leading reasons, or lack thereof, are one of the re leading reasons that um, families end up coming into our system. Um, I think that families with open child welfare cases who receive home-based services are less likely to experience child maltreatment reports. And children experiencing housing insecurity that receive supportive housing programs experience fewer removals and lower prevalence of substantial maltreatment, substantiated maltreatment, sorry, and increased reunification. Access to, to affordable childcare. And while I think the legislature made tremendous steps in access to affordable childcare, the, the one piece that we have yet to figure out is how to get more people to do that childcare. Now we have the spot sitting in our um, child care assistance program. We were an entity that overspent for years and years, um, and now we, we, we were funded by the state, which we appreciate, but now we don't have the providers to provide the care. So you have the same kind of issues that come up there. So before we talk about this particular um, graph, I want to be clear that, that everyone would like to see zero deaths, that that is absolutely what we would like to see for children. It's tragic when any child dies, um, not just to those that love them, but to those that did all the care for them and the professionals who worked with them and their families. Um, hindsight is always 2020, and the path always seems obvious after the fact. Um, the reality is there are so many complexities to human beings, to families, and the system that it's impossible to predict when or if a tragedy is going to happen in many cases. Um, assuming negligence instead of concern, considering system issues is one way to ensure that we're going to continue to go around in the same circles. Um, it goes back to that conversation about collaborative safety, that if we look at something from a system issue instead of a person issue, we're more likely to come to the result instead of just assuming that accountability, that blame equals accountability, because we know that blame it doesn't equal accountability. Uh, the national statistics are not meant to say that Minnesota has no work to do. They're meant to demonstrate that our rates are not abnormally high when you compare to other states in, of similar population. True analysis of data is difficult since each state has different ways of gathering um, and defining issues, but raw numbers should assure us that while we have work to do, we are also doing good work. And I think we need to look at the tragedy of a child's death and try and learn from that. We also need to recognize the professionals who are working hard in a system that's under-resourced and understaffed to protect children. No case manager comes to work to wanting to see the kind of tragedy that occurs when a child dies. It's devastating. I've seen that. I, I've seen it in staff. I've been a part of those unfortunate issues. One way to help keep people in this field is to recognize that and listen to those doing the work and hear what they're telling us we need to do. So in closing, um, the fact that we can't make true data comparisons should tell us all to be careful making assumptions and to invest in data recording and entry so that we can let the data guide us. We need to look through a collaborative safety lens which would say that if we recognize that data, policy, and systems are the issue and not individuals, 
that the people working in the system may feel safer in telling us where we need to make changes and what Minnesota children really need. When we don't recognize that people are doing the best they can, we can contribute to the already daunting staffing issues we have throughout the system. And accountability, again, does not equal blame. Blame is the easier of those two to find. True accountability means assessing our systems and investing in those systems with a critical eye so we can work together to ensure child safety in Minnesota. Um, I thank you for your time, and I would stand for questions. Uh, thank you for your report. Um, we officially have 10 minutes left. Um, I'd hoped we'd have a little more time for questions. Um, I'm going to start with, I, I agree with you that we need to find safe families support unless kids will fall through the cracks. But there are also some egregious cases out there mm -hmm. and cases where it's not even like Monday morning quarterbacking where you look at it and say, how on earth did this happen? And so when we have one of those cases where there have been multiple reports and a child isn't removed and is in an unsafe situation, uh, if we have a mortality case or a near mortality case, what sort of review are we doing to make sure that we are assessing why the process did not work correctly. So Minnesota redid their child mortality review um, after the task force, uh, and, I, and they can certainly speak to it better. I can speak to it being part of our regional ones. We do take those cases, and we, um, we look at all of the data that was involved in them. We look at all of the child protection reports. Because here's one thing I will say is, is to say, well, they had 10 reports, so we know that that means that something should have been done. My question is, what were those 10 reports for, and how many of them were the same incident? Because we can have an incident that was reported on you know, the first of the month and we accept it and we, we do the assessment and we, we follow that through and then we can have the same exact incident, not another report, but the same exact incident reported by another professional and we have to enter that as another report. So it would say that we had, I mean, and that sometimes happens three or four times. So it might say we had four reports, but they were really one incident, not different kinds of the same incident, like not different kinds of neglect, but actually one same incident. So just looking at numbers of how many reports doesn't necessarily give the entire story because of how our data is, is again, how our data is not really well recorded because it's not set up to do that. So I, I think that the, the child mortality review that we, we currently have really does look comprehensively at everything. They look at the child welfare system, and they look at, this, they look at the individual agency's processes, their screening processes. Did they meet staff, sta did they meet state statute when they looked at how they screened? Um, what's the, they go back to the entire history of the case from the very beginning. So even if that the case had a different child in that family five years ago, they go back to that, and they review all of it. But they review it with an eye for what system things are here because it's never just one person or one worker that made those made every decision there's all kinds of factors that went into it so they do review that and they go back with recommendations um, and those come out you know the state accumulates those and they, those come out I can I can tell you having said on our regional one the value for me is more in that conversation that we have regionally when we have situations like that we talk about where resources could have been better or we could have beefed them up more or what screening practices we're using or you know what was the second story behind why that was screened out and let's look at that and talk about that um, so I, I think that the the child mortality review process has actually been fairly fairly good in the last 10 years the timing of it can be difficult because those egregious cases often involve criminal charges and we we simply can't move forward with those child mortality reviews into completion if there's an active criminal charge so sometimes the timing you know is it takes a while to get them but we do the the assessment that's done that I've been a part of have been very thorough and robust um, and I will give everyone else time too. Uh, my other question is, I have personally seen cases of return of child, mm -hmm. children going back to um, the parent that was removed mm -hmm. that made me raise my eyebrows um, where I didn't, especially with drug use, where I didn't necessarily see that there was ongoing like checking in because if someone is clean now, and doing a good job now, that's wonderful, and that would be the goal, but especially when there's a history, you don't know when that goes wrong, 
And now if no one has eyes on anymore, that's a very dangerous situation. And I've personally seen this. I, I would agree that we have. So the, the reality is, is that um, addiction is a disease and relapse is a part of addiction. That, that that's just, that's a hard part of it. Um, the, the hard part is when do you, when are those court ordered services stopped? Because we, we can't, I think that judges and court systems would have a hard time maintaining caseloads if we kept those cases open until kids were, had their own protective factors, like 12, 14, 15, 16, or even until they're 18. Um, and so part of what, what we try to build into those discussions and those conversations with parents is what is your plan for, for if you relapse? What is your plan for addiction? What is, I don't think we can treat addiction like it's a one and done kind of a thing. Um, I think it really does have to be looked at on a continuum and what, what are you gonna do the next time this, that you feel like you're gonna use or you might use or where are your kids gonna go and how are you gonna look at protecting your kids and what safety plans and what safety factors in, are, are there for you? I think that's a more realistic way to look at it because otherwise, you know, based on, on how, what we know addiction looks like and what we know relapse is like, we would have to remove every one of those kids and just keep them out, out of home forever. And that's not, we know that isn't good either. We know the statistics on children that age out of care are not good at all. So, so instead, I think we should be focusing our time on strengthening those families, talking to them about, about what point to come back into us and talk with us more, at what point we can help you more, um, and at what, what are your community factors, what are your safety factors, and how can we create more of those in our community? How can we create more mentors for parents as they exit it out of our system? How can we create a more robust chemical dependency system that involves community supports for people? Because I don't think we're ever going to stop people from relapsing. I think it's part of addiction, but what can we do to help them keep their children safe if and when that happens? I think that's a more realistic conversation to have. And I'll tell you that, that the only way to get families to have that conversation with you is to approach it from a way of, of being honest and recognizing that addiction is a disease. And we understand that you love your children and your relapse doesn't mean you don't. So what can we do together to create safety for your children? And I, I think that that's, um, I think that we need more community resources in first, um, and I think we need more treatment resources and, uh, you know, for, for people with their children, because certainly that's another factor as well. But I, I think at some point, we have to let go if people are doing what they're supposed to be doing. The, the law doesn't allow us to just hang on to families in a court-ordered action forever. So what we should be doing is preparing them for that time by, by connecting them with community supports. I think that's what our workers try to do. We, we have significant lacks in our community supports, though. So again, that infrastructure of services should absolutely include that on the continuum, and we should allow our communities and the communities that, that, our, that the people we serve come from um, allow them to help them through those things. And I completely agree that we fail in, in what we're offering in terms of addiction in the state of Minnesota, and that's a huge piece. Um, but do we differentiate, because I haven't seen that we do, so maybe you can tell me something differently, when it's a child who is so young that they can't verbalize to someone else if something is going wrong, or that they cannot feed themselves if someone is suddenly forgetting them. Do we treat that differently? I, I have not seen that we treat that differently, which concerns me when a child is too young to advocate for themselves in any way. So I think that we, we do, in my experience, we do with our safety plans and our protective factors and looking at what our protective factors are and looking at, at again, you're right, I think that there's a difference between children who have the ability to to create some of their own protection. They're older and can report to people and then children that aren't. So that's where some of your early childhood infrastructure comes in. That's where some of your continued resources and supports for young mothers and young families come in. That's where your public health can come in. I think that there are areas where we can build those systems up. I, I don't necessarily know that we have them um, as to the extent that we should, but I certainly think that, um, yes, there's a difference between a two-year-old and a 14-year-old. I believe there is. And it's, we look at that, the language we use is protective, protective capacity and, sa and, protect and safety capacity. Senator Kern. Thank you, Madam Chair. Going back to my previous comments about caseloads, I, I certainly didn't mean to imply that, that I didn't think there was a labor shortage in this area. <laughs> there, I mean, Obviously, there's a labor shortage everywhere, and I don't deny that it's particularly acute. 
with social workers. That's based on my own anecdotal experience in the courtroom. And I don't doubt there are many case managers, social workers that do have upwards of 20 files. And, but I also know that it's not uniform, at least what I'm being mm -hmm. told in Anoka County, they are under that 10 number that was recommended by the last task force. So, and I do understand that those numbers, uh, the, the cases themselves are getting more complex. Um, and I've experienced that anecdotally too with multiple children, um, multiple different fathers, all adding complexity to someone's file. And maybe there could be a better way to define what a file or what a case looks like, because I still think it's very valuable data for legislators to get their hands on, because you, you, we can talk about budgets or overall labor shortages, but that number to me is in the trenches. That's that case manager, how many files they have or how many children, if you want to say instead, mm -hmm. that they're working with, really matters in terms of two things. One, turnover because mm -hmm. it's going to lead to burnout. And if you're having a turnover problem, that's a big part of it. But two, making better decisions, getting to know that their, their files um, on a more personal level, if the fewer they have, obviously, I think they would be making better decisions in that. And so, you know, I, I, it's, it's data that I think um, is important um, that I would like to see. And if, if we can help define that, um, I think that might be helpful. Um, and then it also leads to something you said that early on in your presentation, you said um, that you would like to see uh, more of a state investment in what you called uh, infrastructure. Could you elaborate more on what infrastructure means to you for the state's role in particular, um, how you would like to see assistance in that regard? Okay. Go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you. I can. Um, so I think family resource centers, that's a fantastic um, process, like Scott County has done it. Other counties across the state are starting to do it. But not all counties have the capacity to do it on their own. So if the state were to bring in some ability to it, some assistance to help establish it, I think that a child who lives in Kitson County and a child who lives in Traverse County or Jackson County or Hennepin County should all have access to the same services, but they don't. They currently don't. There are lots of places where your um, your mental health providers are far and few between and the wait time is extremely long. There's family resource centers aren't something we can even think about or talk about because we don't have planners and the capacity to, to do things like that because we're too small. And if you build them regionally, then they're, they're going to lose the impact because you really need local engagement and local impact for those. Um, I think that some of the services that like chemical dependency services, how fast you get an assessment where your outpatient treatment is, all of those kinds of systemic things, um, the services that we're recommending people do before they get their kids back, sometimes the access and availability is extremely far away. Look at a parent who might be struggling with mental health and so you say partial hospitalization would be a really great thing for you. Well, the, the closest partial hospitalization for some of my locations is two to three hours away. That's not a reasonable thing. It's just not a reasonable thing. Same with children with disabilities, same with children with mental health issues. Um, the services that we really need to serve them are so far away. The gap in services is so huge that they're not, the access isn't there. So some of those things that they were invested on at this, on a statewide level, you would, you would have more equitable access, I would hope. Senator Hoffman. Oh. One follow-up. Uh, Senator Kern. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I appreciate that um, elaboration on that. And going back to kind of turnover again, um, mm -hmm. I think that is crucially important. My observation is that sometimes if I represent a client for multiple years, which is usually how it works in my volunteer capacity, I'm the only constant in mm -hmm. that equation, uh, whether you're talking about the social worker, the county attorney, the guardian ad litem, the judge, everybody else kind of comes and goes. Mm -hmm. But particularly with these social workers, um, the continuity is incredibly important once they get that relationship established with the child um, and understand the unique situation that they're all in. Um, that continuity is, is, is critically important. And I think getting to understand files on a personalized basis, mm -hmm. the individual making good decisions. And so that leads me to my next thing, which is I heard a lot about uh, systemic racism, uh, disparities, and um, 
and certainly bias in reporting is something that should be looked at, and I'm not trying to minimize any of those things, but I hope that um, when you're doing that, we're looking at these things without certain directives, explicit or implicit, so that you end up with a situation where children, um, minorities, are actually less protected than mm -hmm. their counterparts because of pressure to minimize those disparities. And when I hear such an emphasis on those things, I do have concern over that. So you can respond or not respond. It's, oh, thank you. Uh, Ms. Hanson. I, I would agree that um, child safety is the first thing we look at no matter what, and should be, no matter what. Um, I actually think in a case, uh, whether it's removal or non-removal, when it comes to things like like culture and the, and the culture that people are living in, we should not necess we should be asking questions. We should be asking, why did this happen? Um, what, what are the protective capacities within your family? We should be asking questions that are, are culturally appropriate for that child. However, if there's a safety issue, there's a safety issue. Um, I, I don't think, so here, I was listening to the testimony earlier and the questions on that, and I was thinking to myself, I don't think there's a single staff in my, my three or two agencies that pays any attention at all to where our money comes from. They do the work. That's what they're there for. That's what they do. They do the work. And so I don't think that the where the funding comes from or, or any of those kinds of things matter to them. I think where you want to work again on those larger issues is at that broader scale. Not When you're working with the family, you need to address the issues that came up with the family. You need to look at their culture and their own individual circumstances, but you also need to address any safety issues that come up. So I would, I would agree with that. And I think counties as a whole would agree with that. We feel like we'd be getting a more appropriate, um, we'd, be, we'd make sure that the people coming through our system are should be and are appropriate if we're also addressing those larger systemic issues. Thank you. And I have been looking around and checking online, and I see uh, no other questions except Senator Hoffman. So I'm going to ask that this is the last question for today since we are already five minutes over. <laughs> Senator Hoffman. I'll make it short. First of all, thank you. Stacy. every time I hear you bring the perspective from the county, you, you validate what I hear from in this morning in the, in the local county, Anoka County. And, and there's a couple of things I think are takeaways. And um, Representative Pino, maybe this is something to think about as you looked at the jurisdiction or, or who was involved in this. But you highlight, you know, the family resource centers. And, and we know that when we have that embedded within the educational, local educational agency, there's some successes in there. And there's something I think tells us maybe this is something we should be doing there. And those parenting programs or the strength-based um, mm -hmm. parenting programs that work. They're not deficit-based. It's not about shame, but it's about helping rebuild. And that's, you know, when the reauthorization of Part H to C happened, that was what we had to teach people back then was this is Strength-based. This is mm -hmm. not about deficit-based. Thank you for pointing those out. The other, the other person or the other agency is the Office of Higher Education. When you're looking at what is this pathway that we're doing to help, you know, sustain our our, our fleet of social workers or the folks that are working within the county-based system, and and I think um, the biggest one for me is is the highlight of addiction. Not specifically at addiction. Addiction is addiction is addiction, right? And when you look at addiction in Minnesota, we are terrible. Our, our, our recovery rate is terrible, terrible, right? 32 percent or something. It's been the same for, since 1987. And then number one, alcoholism is still the number one factor, right? And then you start mm -hmm. to add the other ones in there. But yet we still don't do anything enough about it. And for you to highlight that it's the family piece, mm -hmm. I guess the question, you know, that we need to go back in the, as the human services chairs, to go back in the, in the um, addiction conversation, behavioral health, and, and, and say, what are we doing to assure that that family peace? That just highlighted a, another systems approach here. And so, you know, um, Chairs Pinto and, and Mitchell, I think, you know, that whole integration of Department of Education, Department of Higher Ed, Department of Health needs to be at this conversation. The Title V public health stuff has to be here, you know. Um, because if you're truly going to do this, it, it, I think um, Stacy Hannon and the, and the county folks should be sitting at the forefront helping us understand just really what's happening there. So um, thank you for once again uh, bringing, bringing that uh, to this, and I appreciate your work.
Thank you. Thank you, Senator. And thank you, Ms. Sennon, um, both to you and to all the testifiers today for providing your expertise. Um, you know, our goal is to discover more opportunities from a legislative and funding perspective um, to make better outcomes for our children. Before we close today, I would like to uh, pass it over to Coach to Chair Pinto, who will have the gavel next time. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks, um, members and members of the public, for being with us. So. Um, so my goal with the task force in terms of my role as co-chair is to drive us toward, to take advantage of this um, increased attention on child protection, which again, the whole reason Senator uh, Lead, uh, Leader Johnson and I want to start this in the first place was because of how little attention this area has gotten in the past. And so I would like to take advantage of that to drive towards changes that can be made in the 2024 session um, to meet the goal that I would hope we all would share of making sure the kids are safe and are thriving. And recognizing that as much as possible, that means being with their families, with their parents where possible, and sometimes that's not possible, then having them be with kin, with people of, uh, with their family, a broader family if possible, and if not, have them be safe and in a good place, um, not with those folks. Um, so I just want to ask members of the public and anybody watching this, please give us your best thoughts and ideas, and members of the task force to be in touch with uh, the chairs as well um, as we push towards having uh, proposals that we can advance to the committees. I should note, I'm so happy to have Chair Hoffman on here because child protection um, issues will pass through Senator Wickland's committee and so glad to have her here and through my committee in the in the House, but also through um, re regarding chemical dependency, et cetera, issues that are overseen by Senator Hoffman and by Representative Noor as well uh, in terms of that. So please be in touch with us. I have a long list of, uh, of ideas that I was going to walk through if we were a little bit earlier in the agenda, but I'll just say, please, uh, everybody, let's bring our best ideas forward so we can uh, improve this system. Thank Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank you, members. Uh, again, thank you everyone for being here today. I, I think this is really something we owe to the children of Minnesota um, to make sure that we get this right to every extent possible. Um, so you've heard many of us say, bring us your best ideas for actual legislation and also other issues you would like us to take a deep dive in. As I said, I, I'm looking at training for mandated reporters, things of that, uh, mortality rates. So um, we would really like to get more into some of those issues in addition to some of our partner groups who thank you so much to some of the partner groups who came here today um, working to make sure we get all those voices. With that, uh, not too, too much over, we are adjourned. <laughs>